but no, nobody seemed to. She was here, right? Oh, um, ah, there we go. <laughs> just, just didn't call, but you didn't need to. Oh, yeah. Well, I should have called them up, but I thought it was a factor. Oh, but it wasn't. Good evening. There is the fateful knock. Welcome to the Wednesday, September 10, 2014 meeting of Moscow Planning and Zoning Commission. First item on the agenda tonight is approval of the minutes of August 27. I was just chatting with Wendy how strange it was to not have been here and watched it on video instead. Okay, thank you, Deb, for a motion to approve. Second. Second, Nels. Okay. Um, comments, corrections? None? All right. Um, all in favor of approving the minutes of August 27, say aye. 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 Opposed? And abstentions? Rebecca and I abstain. And Kurt will abstain when he sits down and thinks about it. <laughs> Great. Uh, next up, correspondence. Yes, will be chair. I'll be careful, Alan. Well, that's the, the Dan Carscal on tall chair, this or is, low chair. This is <laughs> the late guy chair. Where's the telephone booth? Yeah. Yeah. Equalizer. <laughs> the equalizer, yes. Sorry. We'll, we'll focus here. And nothing from staff this evening. <laughs> nothing from staff. Anything from members? I want to say one thing. It's actually a belated thank you uh, to multiple parties, but city staff are know who many of those players are. Today I was coming back from Pullman and noticed at uh, Hatley Drive, that's the turn in off the highway that goes to U-Haul. And then if you follow it up, you get to the bottom of the Walmart parking lot. The bottom of Hatley Drive, there was a rough dirt path that went up the hill to the level of the parking lot where Office Depot is. <laughs> and my thank you is now there is a paved ramp. It loops around to make the necessary ADA kind of grade. And I appreciate the multiple players that must have gotten together to make that happen. All right, uh, next, Joel, Transportation Commission. Uh, the uh, next scheduled uh, Transportation Commission meeting uh, has been canceled. Our next meeting will be in early October. Early October, okay. Thank you. Open microphone. This is a time in our agenda where members of the public may speak to the Commission regarding matters that are not on our agenda tonight or currently pre pending before the Planning and Zoning Commission. Any takers? We have a big audience, so it's exciting. Any takers to just speak about some other topic? Okay. Public hearing. Uh, proposed amendment to Title IV, Chapter 6, Moscow City Code to allow exception to lot street frontage requirements for existing lots of record. Um, let me explain to the audience how the public hearing will proceed. Uh, staff will uh, introduce the subject, and then I will open the hearing and call for testimony of three kinds, testimony in favor, testimony opposed, and testimony of a general nature. Then we will close the hearing, and the panel will discuss amongst itself and make a decision. Uh, if you come to speak, please give us your name and address. And stick around for a moment because we may have questions for you. <coughs> With that, Mike. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the commission. Before you tonight, we have a proposed uh, legislative amendment to the city code, and that's to allow an exception to lot street frontage requirements for existing lots of record within the city of Moscow. And so I know we've been discussing this at the last uh, couple of Planning and Zoning Commission meetings, but just wanted to give you a little bit of background. Uh, presently, we have a number of lots around the city, approximately 26 to 27, that do not meet the current uh, lot street frontage requirement uh, within the code. And now uh, the city had previously recognized these legal building lots uh, when they were first initially platted, uh, and, uh, as well as allowed construction of dwellings upon these, uh, some of these properties. 
city subsequently adopted a standard, I believe that was in the 90s, that uh, states that every lot shall abut a public street other than an alley by at least 40 feet. We had one variance that was approved over the last 10 years uh, to waive this requirement in order to uh, be able to construct a dwelling on the property. Our city attorney has recently reviewed uh, this issue and felt that prohibiting the ability of these lots to develop or redevelop could be construed as irregularity takings and recommends that staff pursue an amendment to the zoning code to exempt out these lots, which is what uh, we've went ahead and done. And I'll just provide one example. I know we had uh, previously provided many, but um, this is just to get your bearings. You have L Logan Street there to the west, uh, as well as Maybell to the north. Um, you have Hidden Lane, which is currently a 20-foot wide uh, alley. Actually, you have a 16-foot right-of-way width for Hidden, 11-foot developed width for access, and you have one lot that's essentially accessed uh, across another lot. And this would be the lot here to the east. And so um, none of these lots meet that minimum street frontage requirement of 40 feet as they're abutting essentially uh, an alley uh, standard. In the current language of the code, uh, I can read the whole thing. Uh, except as provided below, every lot shall abut a public street right away, other than an alley for a minimum of 40 feet. And we also ha go into um, some other deviations from that with cul-de-sacs, uh, shall abut a public street right away, and that's for basically 20 feet, as well as to prove flag lots, uh, which have a uh, long, narrow access uh, road into a, a larger lot at the rear of the property. Those are flag lots. Uh, those are allowed to be 20 feet as well as long as the flag, flagpole portion doesn't exceed 150 feet in length. You also have twin homes and townhouses. Uh, twin homes, the minimum is 20, and townhouses um, basically equal to the distance of the minimum lot width of the applicable zoning district. And so we also have another provision under the code. It says every building hereafter erected or moved shall be on a lot abutting a public street. Uh, all such structures shall be so located as to provide safe and convenient access for servicing, fire protection, and required off-street parking. Uh, the proposed language uh, that staffs put forth uh, essentially to amend that section that I just uh, stated there, basically to provide the same language under A, uh, that every lot shall abut a public street right away, other an alley for a minimum of 40 feet. Uh, and then we've just got these, instead of within the, the whole paragraph text, I've just got these broken out uh, into uh, numbered listed format here. So we've got the cul-de-sacs, we've got the flag lots, uh, twin homes, and uh, townhouses. And we've also got this new uh, portion that's been inserted. It's currently underlined there, listed as number four, stating legal lots of record that have been approved by the city council prior to the adoption of this zoning code in which do not abut a public street right away shall be accepted uh, from this requirement where sufficient permanent legal access is available uh, via public right away, private access easement, or other legal means to provide safe and convenient access for servicing fire protection and required off street parking. And then uh, essentially struck uh, the letter B um, from this section. So. With that, that's our proposed changes before you tonight. I'd certainly stand for some questions if you have any. Okay. Questions for Mike? Nels? Uh, Mike, uh, remind us, if you can, just roughly, when did we write the early parts to this uh, code? When, when we decided that it needed 40 feet or 20 feet? You, can you... Uh, has it been 40 years, or has it been 20? Do you have a rough idea of how long? I believe it first showed up in the 80s and 90s. We had a code adopted in 81, as well as another one adopted around 90. It seemed to me that ever Bill since may have a I've specific been on date. Z, it's been. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I think Bill. it came into force and effect in 1990. 1990, so approximately 24 years ago. Mm. Okay. So... While you've been on PNC, no, I haven't been on that long. I I know exactly when I came on. Okay. <laughs> Other questions for Mike? I have one. Mike, have have there been any uh, dwellings built on these properties since the ordinance in, in the last twenty four years? Uh, 
Not that I'm aware of. I mean, a variance was approved in order to construct a single-family dwelling. Uh, one of the properties, um, they did not pull a building permit to construct that. That was a couple years ago, and the variance approval has since expired. So I'm not aware of, of any in the last few years. Okay. So the variance was to do such a thing, but it was not done. It was to waive the minimum 40 feet of frontage requirement in order to be able to build, you know, uh -huh. at least a dwelling on a property, correct? Uh -huh. Okay. Other questions for Mike? All right. Thank you, Mike. Uh, with that, I will open the public hearing. Uh, and uh, if you would like to testify in favor of the recommended amendment, please come to the podium and state your name and address. Okay, it appears no one is interested in speaking in favor, interested in speaking in opposition to the amendment. Good evening. My name is Danelle Forseth, and I'm an attorney in the law firm, law firm of Landek and Forseth. Our business address is 693 Steiner Avenue, Suite 9, Moscow, Idaho. <coughs> Ron and I represent a group of concerned homeowners in the Residence Street area, um, most of which are here tonight. Christine Moffitt, Andrea Beckett is unavailable, um, Clarence and Barbara Potratz, and Suzanne Lashbrook. I guess our kind of overarching concern is the city's attempt to waive or accept a standard across the board um, without a process that considers site-specific issues and without a process that involves neighboring landowners. We've provided a letter to the city attorney and the community development director late this afternoon, so I apologize for not getting that in your hands earlier, but I wanted to summarize some of those comments and concerns tonight. We don't feel the proposed amendment complies with Idaho Code 676512. And it seems like um, in Attorney Rod Hall's recommendation, um, he saw this as a solution to the same issue. I guess he has the same issue maybe that we had. Um, Idaho Code 67-6512 allows the city to accept or waive standards by issuance of a special use permit or by an administrative process specified by ordinance and subject to the conditions as may be imposed pursuant to the city's ordinance and which addresses the conditions that are set forth in subsection D. Um, that really tries to minimize adverse impacts on other developments um, ensures that development is adequately maintained and requires mitigation of effects of the proposed development on services related to school buses, you know, emergency services, snow plows. Um, and it seems generally requires more restrictive standards than those generally required. Uh, Mr. Hall identified as a solution that the city could amend Moscow City Code as authorized in Idaho Code Section 67-6512 to deal with those unique situations where deviation from the zoning standards are desired. We're in agreement with that suggestion and recommendation um, and feel that if the city desires to waive or accept standards requiring every lot to abut a public street then it must do so by application and issuance of a special use permit or by adopting an ordinance that would consider the conditions that are set forth in subsection D. In reviewing the maps that were provided as part of the packet, it, it appears that all of the parcels that are identified as non-conforming have existing residences and existing street addresses, with the exception of the two on Resident Street. Um, it appears that they have been there in place prior to the 
enactment of this ordinance. And if there is a concern with a regulatory taking by the city, then those could likely be grandfathered in or accepted in some way because those areas have been developed. Um, they pose no future problems as the uses do not require special considerations um, for exceptions or waivers of standards. Those uses, those residences existed lawfully before the enactment of the relevant ordinances. We also felt that the proposed amendment does not comply with Idaho Code Section 676535. In doing away with the requirement that every building be on a lot abutting a public street, the, the proposed amendment eliminates any connection between a legal lot of record that does not abut a public street right of way and access related street improvements that are required in the subdivision code, section 5-1-5. So it seems like while standards still exist for public streets, there wouldn't be standards for public right-of-ways, private access easements, or other legal means to provide access. We don't know if this means that the city would impose more stringent development requirements on an owner of a lot that abuts a public street than on an owner of a lot that does not abut a public street. And finally, the proposed amendment is contrary to the city's initial purpose and intent. And looking back at ordinance number 88-04 that was adopted in April of 1988, uh, the City Council deemed it in the public interest that the requirements of paved streets and sidewalks and subdivisions be uniform throughout the city. That ordinance has about been in effect for 26 years. Um, the ordinance at issue now was adopted in 1990. That has been in effect for the past 24 years. Um, the City's proposed action in simply eliminating the standard for certain lots that do not abut a public street it appears to be contrary to the purpose and intent of the Moscow City Code, Idaho Code, and contrary to the public's interests. Thank you. Um, are there questions for I, I think that staff has a response. I think we'll wait till the public hearing is closed and then. Well, uh, must, but you have questions. One, one question. Uh, you, uh, I believe, said that uh, uh, since all but two of these uh, lots in question have uh, residences currently, that uh, uh, those residences would be uh, uh, protected as by grandfathering. The question is, uh, were they to be uh, burned down, destroyed, uh, would they be able to be replaced under current, uh, uh, current, current ordinance? Well, my understanding of Idaho case law is so long as you're not enlarging a non-conforming use. If you get extending or enlarging a non-conforming use, it would be protected. So I don't think, I mean, if you're not changing from a single family to a multifamily, that would be an enlargement. Our, I believe our usual interpretation of a legal non-conforming use is that if it were destroyed uh, to more than 50 percent, that uh, it would be required to be brought up to current standards. Uh, that seems to me to imply that uh, if any of these legal non-conforming residences were destroyed by more than 50 percent, they could not be rebuilt. Uh, but could it get a comment from Bill here? Uh, 
if I may clarify, the, the standard is if it's destroyed by more than 70 percent, then it may not be reconstructed except in accordance with the standards of the zoning code. Okay. Okay. So presently there are a number of lots with residences that would are n legal nonconforming uses? We have 33 total lots that have right-of-way widths that are um, half of the right of minimum right-of-way width for a city street. And so there are a number of those that are hidden lane on an alley or, for example, on the one-way section of Hayes south of 6 that's, that was actually platted as an alley on the face of the plat. It was named Hayes as a method to address. It's platted at 16 and a half feet in width. And so the question of what's an alley, what's a street is a little bit vague because they tend to mix together. But when we're looking at right-of-way widths that are substantially undersized, that are comparable to alley width, we identified 33 lots generally um, that were in that condition and it, which could be questioned whether they met that standard of being abutting a public street um, due to the minimum right-of-way width that's specified in the code is 50 feet for a street right-of-way. Um, so those lots could potentially be in question. I, we haven't had a case like that, so we haven't had to do a detailed analysis of a determination, but on its face, they may not meet that standard. And certainly there are several that don't. Um, so the, the uh, hidden lane, for example, don't, or there are an, a few lots, three lots, I think, off of what we call Deacon Extension, which is really a shared private driveway that would not meet that standard. And should those structures be destroyed, their ability to reconstruct um, would be limited. Now, I don't know that the city could really defend that position, and we'd be back <laughs> doing something like this to alleviate the the reduction of any economically viable use of the property by de denying that property to be redeveloped when it had been in existence for that period of time. Um, so I think that's that's kind of partially why we're taking that approach is that there are really two options, and I, I can provide more detail later on, but you know there are two ways that you could look at addressing something like this. The first of which is to waive that standard with a conditional use permit in which you still place all those properties into a nonconforming status. We still cannot issue a rebuild letter to a lending institution because it requires an action. It requires that approval. Or you can amend the code to accept those lots that the council had previously approved, but then when they passed that amendment in 1990, decided they didn't want to create any new ones. And so they had knowledge that there were lots that existed. They did not wish to create new, but they were essentially those that were existing existed. Um, and so by this amendment, we are essentially recognizing that those do exist. We are not diminishing their economic opportunity to reconstruct should they be destroyed or to be developed. There are two, I think, of the 33 that, are, that have not yet been developed uh, when that lot was approved by the council at that time with the access only being provided via what is labeled on plat as an alley, the same manner that Hayes is labeled. Actually, Hayes isn't, isn't that one-way section of Hayes isn't even unlabeled. Seventh and eighth are labeled as 40-foot wide alleys. Hayes is an unlabeled. 16 and a half foot wide opening through that plat that's uh, shown as public right away. So, um, but the standard is 70% currently in the code. Did that help, Joel? Okay, thank you. Other questions? Well, I guess I have one um, along those lines in terms of, because I, I remember another case in terms of a, a non conforming use in a zone of not being able to get fire insurance or, or lending. If, if it's not a, um, a, a rebuildable condition. And, and that seems like it might put the current homeowners in, a, in an awkward position if they can't um, rebuild, if they have a total loss, total destruction. And, you know, would that create for them um, fire insurance issues? To, you know, if, if, if insurance companies started looking at the fact that they can't re rebuild if they had a total loss, that, that would be a concern I would have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, this use of the term grandfather we hear it as kind of a lay term, mm -hmm. which is the lay term for legal nonconforming use, but sooner or later grandfather runs into trouble, it seems like. <laughs> Bill. Uh, it, under the code, the, the intent of declaring something a nonconforming use is that it will be lost in time, that it is, that it is allowed to continue. Um, nonconforming structures are actually even limited from doing kind of structural improvements that enhance or extend the useful life of the improvement. And the theory is that they will be lost in time as the use is either discontinued or the structure is either damaged, destroyed, or becomes in disrepair. And the intent of that, that section of the code is that when reconstructed and redeveloped, it will be brought into conformance with the current standards. So that's – they're not technically grandfathered if you're a legal nonconforming use. You were legal at one point in time. The standards changed. You now became nonconforming. And you can continue, 
but should you be destroyed or should the building be moved or should it um, or if it was a use related nonconformity should you discontinue the use for a certain period of time you lose the right to reestablish that use in most instances that still leaves an economic use of the property you know you you may you may lose the right if it was a residentially if it was a for example, if it was a commercial district and residential uses were allowed at one point in time, which is what has happened here, and then they were disallowed at a later point in time, and you had a residential use in a commercial district, you could continue, but we could not write a letter to a lender for a rebuild, so you couldn't get financing on that property. And should it be destroyed, you couldn't reestablish that residential use, but you still had other economic uses of the property. You could develop it for a commercial use in accordance with the zoning that had been established upon the property. Um, if, if we are to the point where we're denying any economic use of the property, that is kind of where we come into the regulatory takings discussion, and, and the city would probably be obligated to either compensate the owner for that economic loss or make accommodations to facilitate an economic use of the property. But it might be helpful to, to collect the rest of the public comment, and we can, right. we can hold on to further discussion until deliberation. I think Kurt had one more question. Yeah. Uh, I need a translation. Uh, so in the broadest terms is the problem you see with this that some of these lots will not be held to the same street improvement uh, standards as regular lots in the city that's part of the problem okay. I think part of it is it's doing away with the process that would allow a site to be looked at you know for specific characteristics and involving the public to just okay. do an across the board waiver that okay. So is, that, is it fair to say then that the other the other objection is that you'd like these lots to be looked at individually and specific I aspects think, of them taken into account? Yes, and I think there's a you sh there should be a distinction between those lots that have existing residences and had those prior to the enactment of this ordinance, and those lots that don't. It may you know. Two of the lots on residence streets may have been platted in 1927, but there's no building there. There's no residence there. There's no dwelling. The neighborhood hasn't developed around a residence or a dwelling there. I think those are different situations than the lots that have existing residences. Could you clarify why you think that's a difference? Because I think the the neighborhood has been developed around those existing residences, people living there, people parking there, um, services being provided to those, whereas these other two lots on Residence Street are vacant. They've been vacant since they were platted in 1927. There's an undeveloped alleyway that they front. But other lots in town, I can think of vacant lots around town, don't, th that front a public street in a standard way, don't concern you in the same way? They would be required to comply with the subdivision code, section 5-1-1. That's still in place, where if you abut a public street, you must meet those requirements. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Other testimony in opposition? My name is Ron Landeck. I'm a Danell's partner. We office at the same address on Steiner Avenue that she referenced earlier. I represent the same group of people that Danell spoke to. I wanted to, uh, I guess, start out by saying I think that the the state of Idaho um, sort of plugged a hole in this whole issue of exceptions uh, and waivers of standards. Uh, prior to a 2012 amendment to the Idaho Code, there was an ex express authority under the Land Use Planning Act to accept or waive standards. And by standards, we're talking about the kind of development standards uh, of streets, of fire access, of things that are other than lot size, setback, you know, yard width, I mean, length of lot, those kinds of things, so, so specific standards. And the reason we're kind of suggesting that the uh, city follow the lead of the state of Idaho is because it really works. It doesn't upset the apple cart. Um, they, the code section that Danelle referenced uh, requires uh, a city, if it wants to accept or waive standards, to adopt an ordinance. 
and that for that ordinance to provide conditions for the development of those lots that are in question as to waivers or exceptions of standards. So it allows for public input. Uh, the process is now codified under Idaho Code. Uh, the, you know, you also, we're talking about nonconformities here. So Joel Hamilton raised that point. There is a, already a, a section of the uh, Moscow City Code that deals with nonconformities. And as uh, Bill Belknap referenced, the, you know, the intent of the nonconformity provision is that th those nonconformities not be enlarged, expanded, or extended. But there is grandfathering, that colloquial term, within the nonconformity statute. And I think when, and there's also a section in the nonconformity statute about nonconforming lots of record, which is we're talking about here. These would be really nonconforming lots of record. They don't abut on a public street. So that, that puts them in that category. But the language of the nonconforming code section, Moscow City Code section, doesn't speak to exceptions of or waivers of standards. So I think one of the kind of easy uh, fixes here would be to look at your nonconformity statute and deal very simply with allowing exceptions or waivers of standards to be um, processed uh, when we have these kinds of situations. Um, there is language in the current nonconformity section of the code that deals with what happens when there's a nonconforming structure and it burns down, you know, disappears through a hurricane. We have had a hurricane in the last <laughs> 30 years. Um, and, you know, what would happen to that if it's destroyed by any means to an extent more than 70 percent? And Right now, your, your, your own ordinance says it shall not be reconstructed except in conformity with provisions of the zoning code. So again, that's another place within your, your own code that you can address the situation by saying, by, by coming to some other, you know, other result. You don't have to uh, say that that can't be restored, that can't be restored. In fact, we'd suggest that it makes a lot of sense to create an exception here for lots that have had houses built on them to be able to be restored uh, and not necessarily have to meet all of the standards that are required by your normal subdivision ordinance, your road standards, you know, all the standards that apply through the subdivision ordinance. So all I think all we're suggesting here is that there is another path to take here that doesn't just wholesale eliminate standards for these special lots that create these kinds of difficulties. And um, so, and this all sort of bubbled up as this particular issue is coming up in a, in a variance context. And it was pointed out to the city that the variance doesn't allow you to waive or accept standards. You can't do it. It's just not permissible by state code. And so, again, we get back to it, I think, to sort of modernize, uh, maybe would be the right term, Moscow City Code would be to get in tune with what the state is really allowing you to do, to do now, which is to accept or waive standards in your development process through a process. Again, getting back to what Danelle talked about, you allow the people in the neighborhood the opportunity to come in and talk to you about why certain aspects of a development just aren't going to work and that you might think about doing it a different way or placing a burden on the developer to do something that they might not want to do, which is the only way it happens safely, you know, with uh, recognition of the fire issues and everything else that goes on with uh, development of property in a, in a neighborhood that's already congested um, or has other other issues. So I guess I'd reiterate that um, I think there, it, it's not that we oppose the result of allowing lots like this to be developed. It's just that the process ought to be one in which there's input, in which there are standards that can be applied, and if they're going to be waived, that it's with a knowing waiver, public input, and uh, I think the public uh, in the end 
comes out the uh, the better for it. Questions for Ron? Have you, um, do you think you're speaking to all 20 or 30 of the lots around town that might be uh, in variance, lots that had been built? Uh, you're, are you just referring to two or three that you're aware of? Have you well, paid I, any attention to the other uh, I looked at the 16 map. or I looked, so? Oh, I saw 26 on the, mm -hmm. the photographs we got, the aerial photographs. 26 lots were denominated as being lacking access to a public street, 50 feet wide public street. Right. Um, and 26 of those had residences on them. And I would venture to say all 26 were probably constructed before the the zoning ordinance was adopted by right, the city of right. Moscow. The only two lots that don't have residences are the ones on Residence Street. And, um, and, and really kind of became the focal point of think of why this is all happening. But I guess I, I spoke earlier to the fact that a, a, an amendment to the nonconformity non section of the code could address all of those existing structures and and make provision that they could certainly be rebuilt. They've been there. I agree with Danelle. They've been there. The neighborhood's adjusted to whatever the disadvantages are of narrow alley streets, um, you know, difficult access. Whereas if you're dealing with a, an undeveloped parcel, it, it raises different issues just because of the, the nature of the, you know, the neighborhood or the congestion or what might change. So I'm, I'm thinking that, yeah, there's a couple ways to go about it, but addressing the nonconformity, you know, adding sections or language to the nonconformity section of the code would be a good start, and then putting a process in place generally. I mean, you have other issues, I think. I don't know for sure, but I would think you've got situations out there where people come to the city and want to waive or accept a standard. It could be a standard for sewer. It could be a standard for anything. And I think it would be helpful to you to have an, you know, an ordinance that allows for the city to make exceptions in those cases where uh, the public is involved and, but conditions can be set in order for development to go ahead with a waiver or with some exception, but it be a process that everyone gets a chance to comment on. Can staff remind me how many, how the, the lots that we're talking about that do not have a house on them, do you have any idea of the size of those lots? Are we talking seven, ten thousand? Do you know uh, how many square I don't feet have they a are? size. Uh, the one of the resident street alley was roughly uh, 21 to 23,000 square feet in size. Uh, the one directly to the east of it, um, I believe that was a little bit less, probably around 9,000 square feet in size, 10,000. So they're not little teeny tinies. Well, they're encumbered with topography as well, which limits the development. Yeah. And that, that, that's one of the reasons that we advocate this and why the neighbors are advocating this is you got, you got some is topographical issues to deal with in that particular situation. And you don't know what you face in other situations, but I think you can be more flexible in your approach by the, by the process that we're suggesting versus eliminating a standard that would, there would be no standard for these difficult lots. Ron, I still see, I mean, I see, I understand the difference between an undeveloped lot and ones that already have houses on them and have had houses on them for quite some time. And I guess what I don't see a way around and what you're suggesting is to alleviate the uncertainty of the people who are living in, in substance on, on properties in in um, houses that were built before this ordinance was put in place, and you know how do how do they get reassured that if their house burns to the ground, they can they can redo it without having a conditional use permit where they're getting public input to see if they can rebuild their house. I that that's where I have a problem. No, I'm not saying that. That, that that's what I'm having trouble. Seeing well, I around. mentioned two yeah. two approaches on the developed lots. Presently, existing residences developed um, prior to the ordinance that are nonconforming, change your nonconformity statute. And just not consider uh, yes. To allow those, those people to build another residence on that lot that is not enlarged from, you know, the square footage of the prior residence that does not enlarge the use to make it, a, you know, 
duplex rather than a single family home so they can build what is already there they you can, can replace you can the you can exactly. do that in your in your ordinance yeah. you don't need a public hearing for that i'm suggesting on these other situations you need that public hearing other questions for Ron? Just, yeah. just one last, again, clarifying. So it sounds like the major concern is those undeveloped lots. You would have no objection to the developed lots having some guarantee of some sort that they can rebuild just no, what they've got. Our clients don't, and I think philosophically, you know, I don't have any objection to that. I mean, it seems to me that's only fair. I think it's draconian. If somebody's house burned down, they couldn't build it back on the lot that they lived on for the last 60 years. Ron, but that's what your ordinance says right now. Yes. Right. We have a legal, uh, an issue of illegal nonconformity, yes. Um, my question is this. It would appear, just thumbing through the examples that are here in our packet, that some of these lots are large enough they might be subdividable into two lots of workable size. And I suspect that some of these existing residences are in neighborhoods where the zoning allows for something other than a single family residence. Would your approach require that the owner could not subdivide the lot and or could not take and turn the single family residence into the duplex that would otherwise be permitted by the zoning? As to existing residences that might burn down it would be automatically able to rebuild. It, it, you, you might have to go through a process beyond the enlargement. If you wanted to enlarge that use or in any way or enlarge the structure, I guess I'm suggesting that's where you'd need the exception or the waiver because that then becomes a situation just like the undeveloped lot. You're putting more pressure on that neighborhood. And so the neighbors in this community wisely want to talk about those things with you and the powers that be. So I'm not suggesting that they don't have the right to do that. Again, it could fall within the same waiver or exception ordinance that I'm talking about, that you could waive the standards that apply to, let's say, uh, enlarging the use of a, an existing non-conforming situation where there is a residence. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions for Ron? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Other testimony in opposition? I apologize that I did not email this to the city, but I have sufficient copies to believe. My name is Christine Moffitt. I live at 419 Sunset Drive, which my property else. abuts we have. Um, two of the properties that we are talking about that are undeveloped on Residence Street. And I also own a duplex on Residence Street at 723 and 725. Um, I stand to support the position that our attorneys Landek and Forsyth put forth uh, to you tonight. And I think their assessment uh, provides a clear illustration of the contradictions that we have with this proposed amendment between the city code and the Idaho code. And I'm a longtime citizen and property owner and I'm usually very enthusiastic about the process that the city has for for um, citizens and commissions to interact and provide a high quality environment for for everyone and uh, but I might back up a little bit and, and and actually applaud the effort that Landek and force have initially put forth is the reason that we're here tonight actually because we had um, contracted with them over um, an issue of a hearing that was uh, to have a, a variance process. And uh, they brought forth that, that, the, that the city was out of compliance using the variance process with the 
Idaho Code. So the, we're kind of responsible for why you're here tonight and why we have this proposed solution that I feel is pretty inadequate addressing the issues that we're trying to address. So in, in the response to the LANDEC uh, and Forsyth letter uh, earlier this summer, uh, the city attorney, Rod Hall, provided a memorandum to Belknap on, in your packet on the 8th of August, and that it reiterated the amendment that we're talking about in, in 2012. And in, in that amendment, um, the attorney recommended that you folks uh, could amend the existing code to, to waive requirements. It suggested that. But I want to point out, the last thing he said in his statement there was to quote, more research should be required to analyze what the effects of such an ordinance may present to development in the city before the city decides that, that this is a route that it intends to take. That's why I'm here tonight. That's why we're here tonight to provide more of that research to you about why we think this is a bad idea. And we feel that because a development is not on a public street, street it should not, never be exempted from the requirements that are in the code, the Idaho code, those eight requirements that are in the memo that I just gave to you that, that, that really enhances the ability for a community to respond. Because prior to that, it was really limited to what, how much, how much uh, exposure you had to the road, and a few other details. So this provides a much more comprehensive approach to development, which is in concert with the way Moscow has looked at development in the past. <clears throat> so I'm just addressing particularly the undeveloped properties that, that would be excluded if you adopt this ordinance change um, from all the elements of a conversation and, and dual due process to evaluate a case-by-case -case concern. And um, I think what that does is present a real burden, a tremendous burden on the existing properties, uh, and it pretty much shows disregard for, for this due process. So in conclusion, you know, there are reasonable ways to deal with this, and we have pleaded with the city since this whole controversy began two years ago. Some of you remember this whole issue with this variance process. We think there's reasonable solutions. We think that a road can either be put through, there's an existing, and, and I think, uh, Dr. Potratz is going to bring out some components about the undeveloped properties that you can understand. But there are, there's a 30-foot wide easement on the alleyway and there's a 20-foot wide easement in the alleyway. There's a couple of different solutions that could be made in the development. But, but that is not really your decision today if you don't proceed with this proposed amendment. Um, in summary, I, I stand in strong opposition to this proposed amendment and urge the city to further work with all of its citizens to achieve a fair and rational solution to address undeveloped non-conforming lots. Any questions? Thank you. Questions? Uh, um, Just got one, uh, one um, clarification. Uh, this uh, amendment or this uh, suggested uh, proposed language would have to do with uh, a properties ac uh, access to a road, but it wouldn't alleviate other requirements. I mean, there, there are many requirements if you're going to do development. Am I... Am I uh, I'll, I'll, de here. I'll defer that to our attorneys, but in, as far as I'm 
can I mean, interpret I mean, this. Uh, it, this it sort isn't of saying the, all things are off the table. It's just saying you don't have to have 40 feet on a right of way. Uh, where am, am I missing something? Mr. Chairman, uh, that's correct. All it is is alleviating the requirement that you abut a public right of way other than an alley for that distance. All of the development standards would still apply. Now, you can look at the, the disparate requirements for public improvements from a corner lot to a flagpole lot to a lot that doesn't have frontage on the public street. And all of those are going to have a, a, a different public improvement requirement because a corner lot may have 200 feet of frontage, an interior lot may have 60 or 80, and a flagpole lot may have 20. And so that's just a function of the lot that you have and the improvements that are necessary and required. All of the public street standard, public approaches, driveway standards um, to gain access to a public street are all going to still apply. And there is an alley standard that has been developed and recently adopted when the council adopted the new street and construction standards last year that has a paving standard for alleys. And so that would be the standard that would be applied if it was a property that was, say, adjacent to, a, to an alley. So there are still all the other public improvements. There are still all the other building, fire, sanitation, and other code requirements that are going to apply to a property, this would just accept that, you know, that condition for where, you know, the requirement that you butt that, the public right way other than an alley. That's, that's the only thing that it is alleviating that lot standard condition within the uh, zoning code for those lots that have been previously approved and recognized by the city. Just a last little uh, t a technical question. If uh, you've been looking at this for the last two years and you've been working diligently about it, how is it that this letter came to us so early? <laughs> so late. Well, I'm being a little bit cynical here. <laughs> I mean, uh, you're just suggesting to me that this has been on your plate for some time. No, no, so no I, I think. I'm just trying to figure uh, okay, out. I, I'll I mean, it came that. to me at, at dinner time. Hello? Uh, uh, let me let me clarify, okay? About two years ago, we were before you with a proposed zoning change to allow one of those lots to be developed as a single-family residence. If I may, Mr. Chairman, just to clarify, that would have been the Board of Adjustment and not the Planning and Zoning Commission. So they have not seen this previously. Okay. We kind of look the same, you know, we're old. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> it was a long time ago. And, <laughs> and since that time, that property was never developed. <laughs> Sorry. That was Sorry. never developed. And the uh, it expired. The right to develop it expired. It changed hands, and a new owner wanted to develop it as a duplex. So we went through a whole proceedings to try to talk about that in public hearings. And this summer, when we engaged attorneys in this, because we didn't seem like we were able to approach it any other way, um, they were very helpful in providing that they they felt that the, the use that the the approach was was inappropriate given the Idaho code so that happened and so um, we did not we were here at your your meeting two weeks ago right um, and well that was my point you were here at the meeting two weeks ago and you didn't have that this letter at that no time. but it took a while to put it together okay, and it, it, right. it is uh, the asking. end of the summer vacation, so um, so a number of us were were busy with with other things. Um, I know how busy life is. It's okay. Other uh, may questions? May I ask yes. a question? Gregory. Um, one of the concerns that's been expressed by the uh, city staff and the city attorney is that if a, a situation in the code exists such that the use of, a, of land is completely taken away. In other words, the house burns down or you, you can't, can't build an otherwise buildable lot, rebuild on a, on a lot, that you have a, 
an unlawful taking. In other words, you've, you've, you've basically deprived the owner of all use, practical use of the land. I, is there any use that you would find acceptable on these two lots in Residence Street? I, Mr. I, Chairman, I, you, I just, don't want to. If I might, I, I really, this is a legislative amendment. I know it does apply to a variety of properties, so we're not, I really want to not be having a quasi judicial hearing and a legislative hearing context. Thank you for that. <laughs> and so I'd really rather not get into a discussion of any individual piece of property. In a general context, we have shown other properties. You have all the properties that we've identified, but I really don't want to hone in on just the, the, the two undeveloped and have a quasi quasi judicial hearing um, <laughs> conducted during a legislative consideration that, that is just my advice you are the chair and, and uh, so it, that is coming. it is your advice that we not distinguish any particular property in this process and therefore not recognize that there are some that may be developed and undeveloped there are simply a number of properties that all have the same characteristic that would be my recommendation or to negotiate what use could be viewed acceptable by the neighborhood I mean that, that what we're talking about is a is what is before you this evening right. the suggested language to accept existing recognized approved lots from that requirement I would recommend that it stay on that context so with that Gregory I think I'm going to follow staff's advice Could, can I broaden the question to all lots then? You may. And, and I I wasn't I understand your point, but the discussion has been about these two lots all night, so that's why I honed in on those. So let me ask it in a, in a broader context. Um, all, of, all of these 20, 28 lots, um, if, if a house burns down more than 70 percent such that it can't be rebuilt, is, is there a use that, I guess, what would you envision would, would be acceptable in that situation? Well, I, th I think... <laughs> Mr. Landek ad addressed that in your prior question that that right now you have a code that and I, I I was raised by a lawyer but I'm not a lawyer um, you have a code that says y you can't rebuild and so he's suggesting that you fix that part of it that allows the developed properties and I'll let Ron answer that in more detail but what we're addressing is that why why are you putting two undeveloped properties and it seems rather coincident to me that these are the properties that have been in in everyone's craw for a while they're suddenly on this list it doesn't make sense to me and and going through this whole process I'm not sure that we would have dual process as you're as you're saying to evaluate the uses and the approval for for um, bringing those into development so and maybe Ron can answer a lot better all right these. thanks thank you any other questions procedural item for staff Ms. Moffitt's letter do you have what you need I don't have a copy no copies I'll pass mine down just so that they have be sure they have enough to meet their needs Christine I, th I think you Turn this to us uh, in oh, there. Really <laughs> yes. <Okay. laughs> All right. Is there any other testimony in opposition? Please come forward. <clears throat> uh, my name is Clancy Potratz. I live at 425 Sunset Drive, and I speak in opposition to the proposed. Uh, code amendment. Uh, there are, as you, we have discussed or heard discussing, uh, two types of lots identified in in this amendment: developed and undeveloped. Uh, um, the count that I saw was Excuse twenty-two. Me for a moment, are, has staff identified that there are developed and undeveloped lots, or are there simply lots? Staff does not draw a distinction between developed and undeveloped property rights of equally in what's the term we're trying to similarly situated lots we believe should have similar in situ, uh, property rights I guess I should say there are lots that you can see that were identified in the packet that didn't meet the standard that have structures upon them and there are a couple lots that do not 
Uh, it is not staff suggestion that there be a distinction drawn because a property right for the property should be equal for similar situated properties in our recommendation and I think in the city attorney's opinion as well. Um, but I don't know if that answered your question. Okay. I think it did. So I thank you for allowing me to interrupt, just trying to clarify that staff does not perceive that there is well, a difference. There are, in fact, whether you divide them this way or not. There are developed lots and there are undeveloped lots that uh, are involved in this uh, uh, amendment. Uh, and they're completely different, completely different animals. Um, there are, of the 24, 22 examples of developed lots and two undeveloped lots. Those two undeveloped lots were noted in the paragraph that the uh, attorney, I think, wrote about. So I think we can go into some detail with those. Those have been brought up already for, for and singled out by that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, last week in the testimony that we had about this, they were all about developed lots about dire consequences would, from some people when, when their house would get destroyed about being able to replace it. Um, I, I think that uh, the idea of letting them replace it is, is uh, reasonable. And, and uh, one should work on, on that to, to uh, you know, allow that although I'm not sure it's all that necessary, considering the numbers of cases that you would have, but, but I'm not interested in that, because that doesn't uh, uh, really affect me. Uh, in fact, I can think of no person in Moscow who would be Machiavellian enough to not allow someone to rebuild if their house had been destroyed. I don't see that that would come up very often. Uh, to me, the big issue is the undeveloped lots. Uh, on the other hand, if this amendment is passed, then it takes away uh, my right as a citizen, as a taxpayer, as a neighbor, to have an input on the future events that affect me. There's no public hearing. That was at least one benefit of the variance process. There was, there, you could have a, the neighbors could have an impact on this, input on it. Uh, so that it isn't so abstract. Just if I can get it in the right direction. Here's Here's a map showing the two undeveloped lots that have been singled out by the, the lawyer in the paragraph and have been under discussion. Excuse me. I don't me. know if there's been any other undeveloped lot identified. Excuse me. Right? Has there been one? Excuse me. Yes. Staff has advised me that we should not turn this into a quasi-judicial hearing regarding specific properties. So if you wish to speak to the general code amendment, I welcome to hear your testimony. But if you wish to focus on a specific piece of property, um, that is not the subject of our meeting tonight. I don't agree with, with that because it's been brought up that, and these two lots have been singled out. So I object to that restriction. Objection is noted, uh, but st you heard staff's advice to me. What, what I'm trying to say is, is that if, if this amendment passes with and includes undeveloped lots, then there's no way in the amendment that I can have an input. There's no official hearing required. As I understand it, the decisions are made by city employees. Is that correct? Or am I mistaken? Bill? 
um, the property owner would have all the same rights of all the other properties similarly situated in that zoning district. And so it would just be a, there would be no public hearing required and it would be just a building permit process. Thank you. Uh, I've listed a number of things that uh, I guess I cannot mention. Uh, things that are important uh, in the decision-making process that this refers to uh, that I would not be able to to input into this. Uh, can't even tell you what they are. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't know. I, I don't want the proceeding to be overly strict, and, and so certainly, you know, general discussions or general comments about about the, the situation. I mean, I, I don't want to be overly strict. We, we got in the discussion of what you, land use would you, could you accept on those lots was a, was what made me, mm -hmm. I guess, uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to be overly restrictive on the opportunity for the public to provide input and comment on the proposal. So um, I guess I don't, I don't want to be so restrictive that the gentleman doesn't have an opportunity to provide his input and comments to the commission. So, um, And how am I to interpret that relative to your concern that we not speak about specific properties? Mm. Well, it's certainly if there are considerations, if there are um, considerations of existing properties or undeveloped properties that a public hearing would provide an opportunity to provide comment upon, um, the gentleman can certainly provide those examples. I mean, I, I guess I, j I just don't want to be overly restricted. I mean, certainly it's a legislative hearing. It's talking about a broad an amendment that, that affects a broad uh, range of properties. I guess the, it was we were getting the specificity about you know what would be acceptable specific or not was 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 site. did cause me some concern in that discussion, but I don't want to be overly restrictive um, in the providing the public the opportunity to provide comments. So um, okay, I guess thank you, thank you for interpret that as you may. I guess I, I just <laughs> I don't want it to be <laughs> too Ball tight. To and you. I don't All want right. to deny the, the public yeah, opportunity to provide comment. His uh, <coughs> make his discussion in a generic sense about. Developed and undeveloped, developed lots. And undeveloped lots in general, as opposed to this specific. Yes, I think that I think that fits with the spirit. What we don't wish to be doing is turning this into a hearing relative to two specific lots that happen to be in a particular location. So, if you can uh, phrase well, some of your I input to us, uh, then if this amendment passes. Uh, uh, then uh, the 40 foot requirement abutment requirement would vanish. Is that correct? Uh, for existing approved lots, that would be correct. Pardon? Yeah. For existing approved and recognized building lots, that's correct. So, so for existing approved lots, not as a general rule that the 40 foot abutment would go away only for a very narrow set of existing lots. I still don't understand, I'm sorry. So any lot that has been recognized by the city, either through the approval of a subdivision plat, <coughs> or through the approval of a lot division, or through the approval of the issuance of a building permit upon the property, would be exempted from their requirement. Any new subdivisions, any new lots created, uh, would still need to meet that standard, whether it's 40 feet, whether it's 20 feet for a cul-de-sac, 20 feet for a flagpole, or if it's done through planned unit development, we have a number of lots through PUDs that do not abide a public street, but they have are essentially granted that waiver through the planned unit development process. But the, and we recounted them, there's 36 lots, I guess, that we have that we had mapped out. So those lots that are in existence would not need to meet that standard. I have one other I, question. I don't understand. If, uh, uh, if a lot in of, of the 26 or so lots that we have, if an undeveloped lot was, a request came to subdivide that lot, would this still hold or would it, in other words, if, uh, what changes if you decide to subdivide? 
So it would no longer be a lot that was in existence at the time of the adoption of this exactly. amendment. So that would be that lot would not be eligible to be created um, through that or, process, or, or if created, would not be eligible to be developed using this exclusion. That's correct. Okay, so we really will never have more than the if, if you just counted the lots that we have now, wh whatever the number that you have counted. That is the intent with the exception of something that may happen through a PUD process outside of this whole standard. Which would, which would create a whole new animal, but has its own governing process. Has its own governing process, has its own standards, so it's, that's through the PUD process. Okay. Is there any additional um, testimony in opposition? Is there any testimony of a general nature? All right. With that, I will then close the public hearing. You didn't. You didn't ask for testimony in favor. I don't. Well, I, I, I guess, started with yeah, that. I guess you started with and that. And yeah. there was none. No one okay. came okay. to the party. Okay. All right. No one came to the in favor party. <laughs> so with that, I've closed the public hearing, and it is time for the commission to deliberate amongst itself uh, regarding the proposed um, code amendment. Well, not understanding the um, sort of state ordinances, I had a question for Bill about what Mr. Landek presented in, about the non-conformities and whether that's a better route for us to take and for ensuring that the people who have developed properties can redevelop them in, in the event of total loss. That's um. that, that's my, I don't know if that question and, makes and sense. Bill, maybe you wish to also sort of expand on your answer to bring in the city attorney's response to the Landeck letter of this evening. I will attempt to do so. Um, so I guess there are, I think there are, there are several ways in which the same outcome or a similar outcome could be achieved. The you could go in and just expand the non-conforming lots of record section and add, um, so the non-conforming lots of record section of the zoning code states that a zoning a platted approved, previously approved lot that does not otherwise meet lot width or lot area standards may be developed with a single family dwelling. Um, Moscow was developed with a large number of 25 foot wide lots and you bought as, or 20 foot wide lots and you bought as many as you needed. Uh, and the city changes standards over time for lot width and lot area. And that grants uh, use of properties or lots that were previously approved that don't meet that uh, lot or lot area or lot width standard. Um, so you could go into the nonconforming section. You could create an exception of this requirement there for existing lots that have been approved. And it would have essentially the same effect. I mean, that's that's ultimately what is achieved here is that it is there is a standard for a minimum abutment on a public right way other than an alley. There are variations for different sizes of lots or different shapes of lots, whether it's cul-de-sacs, whether it's flagpole, um, whether they uh, are a townhouse or a twin home lot. And this creates an exception for those lots that were previously approved by the city with an access in a different configuration than you know, 40 feet on a public street. You could create that same similar exception within the non-conforming section if you wish to. I mean, those are two places where you could modify the code to provide for this exception. So those are two ways and that you could do it through those that fashion. Um, the section that is referenced in um, the letter that we've received this afternoon of 67, 65, 12 is a section of the, of the uh, LUPA that refers to special use permits. And essentially all of the language um, that's uh, identified in the, um, actually I guess you don't have the full, you don't have the full section here, but the, um, the items one through eight that talk about, uh, you know, item number D, upon the granting of a special use permit, conditions may be attached to a special use permit, and then it goes through the eight items that are listed. 
those items have always been in Idaho code to guide the approval process of special use permits and some of the conditions or limitations that, that cities can impose. So it's not unique to item F. You see they kind of provide the citation of F ahead and then D continues down below. So F actually within the, the statute falls below. That was an amendment to um, the state code that the legislature did enact in 2012. It was in response to a case in Teton County where um, a county was granting a height, building height exception through a condition use permit process. And so it was a concrete batch plant. They had a 45 foot height limitation and they were allowing an exceedance of that height through a condition use permit. And actually it was somewhat of a common practice of communities to use condition use permits to waive things that are actu were actually prior to 2012 specifically identified as things that could only be approved through a variance process. So the building height, building placement, uh, lot area, lot width, um, the placement of the structure and the size of lots were things that were really specifically identified in Idaho code as being uh, land use regulations that can only be, could only be waived through the variance process. Uh, Teton County approved it through a condition use permit that was challenged and essentially they lost that challenge in Supreme Court in 2011. The legislature turned around and then passed an amendment in 2012 to give that authority to cities that if you wanted to, to have the ability to waive a standard through the CUP process, you have that opportunity. Um, so that's kind of a new power, a new entitlement of power that, that um, cities and counties have been granted in response to that instance, that case, and the legislation that was passed at that time. Cities always have the ability under 6511 to adopt zoning ordinances, amend zoning ordinances, change your standards over time like we do on a fairly regular basis. So 6512 does not preclude you from just modifying your standard, let's say in this fashion, to address something rather than requiring a condition use permit. And we did have the 36 lots that were in various conditions of right away that were less than 50 feet in width. And I think I've already said previously that we felt that requiring those properties to get a condition use permit to rebuild, you know, put them in a similar jeopardy that it may be in today, and that we really couldn't issue a rebuild letter. We could say, well, they could be reconstructed if they obtained a condition use permit, if that was, or a special use permit, if that was a process by which we wanted to waive that standard. Um, in our view, when you're dealing with a, a wide number of properties that have the same common condition, the best fix is a legislative change to address that condition and, and whether that's done in the non-conformity section or whether that's done in the lots and access standard and providing that exception there, those are two options that, that would have the same exact outcome. Um, and so, you know, I guess I'm not sure that necessarily the statement that doesn't comply with 6512, I don't know that it necessarily, there are other options, you can use 6511 just to amend the zoning code as we have suggested and the city attorney said, suggested previously. So you know, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. They're, those are two different avenues to come to the, to the same outcome and you need to look at what is the implication upon the broader, not just two properties, but the broader properties that are in the city, what condition and what nonconformities exist and what's the best resolution to that, to that situation. Um, if you were to look at the idea of distinguishing between lots that are developed and those that are undeveloped, that's where I would disagree and that all property that's similarly situated in the same zoning district should have the same rights. And just because somebody happened to pull a building permit at one point in time and another property owner did not, and therefore then they're denied some right, I think is is a maybe a difficult position for the city to take. And somebody could argue that, well, my property is the same, the access is equivalent. Um, we have many properties that are accessed off 11 foot wide developed alleys in a 16 foot ride avenue uh, right away and I have there's a 20 foot right away here and it can be developed 20 feet in width and they can develop or they can redevelop if they get if they're destroyed but I can't use my property without seeking special permission and so that's I don't know that we necessarily want to make a distinction and we really don't make a distinction um, in the code beyond the nonconformity section for properties that are developed or undeveloped and, and conferring different property rights to properties based upon their development status. The nonconformity is really the section where you do have that and the premise is that they established that legal right prior to us changing the code that made it nonconforming and so therefore they are granted that because it was a legally allowed use or, or a legally allowed structure at that point in time when it was established. Um, 
the sections that relate to the subdivision code and the public improvement standards, uh, I don't see that this changes any obligation to public improvements. If you're not adjacent to a street, yes, you're not going to have to develop a street. Um, it's just you're not adjacent to a full public street. And you can have a, uh, they talk about the disparity of the requirements of public improvements. And as I mentioned, you can have a corner lot, you can have an interior lot, you can have a flagpole lot, and they're all going to have different development or improvement obligations or burdens um, when they're developed at that point in time just because of the nature of the property. Um, and then with respect to the, you know, it's not in keeping with the intent of the um, prior legislative actions of the city code. Um, I suspect the intent in 1990 was to ensure that we didn't have more lots created that didn't abut a public street. Um, at the same time, we have other intent statements for compact development and we have PUDs where we have 40 structures accessed off 20 foot wide interior private streets. Um, you know, I'm sure the intent is, was to try to provide for adequate access and fire protection and servicing of individual properties. And it's not our intent to create new lots of this nature, but just to recognize those lots that may already exist. Um, and so I, I, I don't know this necessarily in contrary uh, to the intent um, as these were pre-existing lots that had been previously approved by the council. Uh, was there something I, else that I needed to cover or a question? So since there's no, on these undeveloped lots, they, they tend not to have a city frontage, a lot of them, a city street frontage. They're alleys not, not on the, many of them. No. Not that they're undeveloped, but that some of these. So, so no, I'm not. I don't care whether they're undeveloped lots or developed lots. But all of these have the property of not fronting but, a street. But they're not fronting a street. So I understand they would still have to meet all of the other standards other than the 40-foot minimum. But how does that come into play when we have front yard setbacks and side street setbacks? And, and in essence, there are no streets. So where would a building be located if you if you could build on the lot if you, if you could even physically build on one then what happens it, how do you oh, so l lacking a street how do you how do you situate a house the rest yeah, of the how does that happen <laughs> if, if it was adjacent to a public right away and that was the means that it was gaining access and we we utilized that we would utilize that and probably declare that as the front okay much like a street uh, flagpole lots are a little more challenging. Typically, we go to the end of the flag and set a point in the center and then draw an arc for a setback on a flagpole lot. Those are actually kind of some of the, the stranger ones. But if it was accessed off an alley, we would take a look and, and we would, you know, this will be done on a case-by-case -case basis. But typically, the means of access, the right-of-way that it abuts, if, it, if there's a right-of-way, we would utilize that as what we declare to be the front uh, lot line. But every other standard would have to be met. met. S sewer, water, sewer, Certainly. heights, um, everything else that's in, in place would still apply. All other development standards would still apply. That's only just, it's only for the existing lots. Um, it's just waiving that abutment on something other than an alley, a public right of way other than an alley. Mr. Chair, I just have a Let me get to all first. Um, I certainly agree that it's um, appropriate for some non-conforming use uh, to to be able to re be rebuilt if if it uh, if there's an existing uh, um, residence uh, on it, um, and I uh, I understand the uh, um, desire to treat uh, all property the same with or without uh, uh, existing development. Of, but I'm also uh, hearing concerns, some concerns about uh, expansion of use uh, that uh, might, that uh, our proposal, that, that staff's proposal here might enable. Uh, I understand that uh, um, it would not be uh, possible to uh, subdivide a non-conforming uh, uh, lot and uh, the, uh, the fragments would not be, uh, uh, would not meet the standards. So that could not happen. 
but uh, a existing single family residence uh, on a alley in a uh, multifamily district uh, could, uh, um, under what we propose, uh, become a, uh, a duplex, uh, an expansion of use. Uh, and I think that has that has consequences for uh, health and safety. Uh, has consequences for for traffic and, and snow removal. I think the neighbors do have a legitimate interest in uh, expansion of use. Um, and I don't quite know how to address that, but it seems it seems as though it might be addressed more easily in the non-conforming use section uh, than the, the way it was proposed by staff. Okay. So, it, to be sure I understand, your concern is that there might be further consequences from expansions of use that might merit more review because these properties are all in special circumstances yes. on, on narrow frontages on narrow rights of way yes okay thank you uh, Nels you had a did, did you uh, did mr. Hall uh, see this letter uh, which one are you the, referring to or the letter that came From to us tonight Landek and Associates he replied in this little oh, and that was a reply <laughs> not this letter Huh? No, not no, that letter. The land that not the letter that Ms. Moffat provided. No, not that letter. No. I just mean the land act. These Correct. two, which were handed out at the beginning right. of the meeting. So, so which one was this? This letter yeah. right here from uh, from uh, Rod was a, a response. Was a response. Five ten p.m. Okay. to. Oh, it's a memo. Yeah. Yes, it's a, yeah. it's not a letter. It's yeah. a memo. Yes, he has did have a chance to review it. He didn't have a great deal of time to analyze it. We talked it through, um, but. He has had a chance to review it. Okay. Um, other discussion? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <coughs> so it sounds like the, the city attorney's opinion is that the city is in danger of of engaging in a legislative taking or a taking of, of property values by not allowing use of, a, of an approved lot. Is that reasonably true that's correct I think yeah. in his memo he indicated that it could yeah. constitute regulatory takings and so if you made a distinction between developed and undeveloped then that really wouldn't eliminate the taking problem it would just narrow it it would seem like correct if you would single out the two parcels that were undeveloped if you were to make a distinction between the two between those that have a structure upon them or those that do not, um, that, that, that wouldn't <coughs> remove the potential takings. Yeah. And then I, you know, I, want, I would question if, if it's actually an expansion of use if somebody is using a legal lot in an R3 zone for an R3 purpose. Uh, I you know, I, I, it's one of those things of, yeah, <laughs> is it legally an expansion of use? I mean, I know it is in reality, but, you know, can you make, I mean, can you make that distinction in terms of of trying to narrow a use in a, in a, in a certain zone okay. for just one single piece of property? I mean, it's kind, <laughs> of the, it's kind of the reverse of spot zoning. You know, you're sort of unspot zoning. <laughs> let, let me try, see if this works for you as a question to Bill, which is um, in, in Joel's thinking, he was exploring the expansion of use, perhaps the adding of a duplex to where is presently a single family residence, but on a lot that would otherwise, other than the frontage, meet the requirements for it's properly zoned it's got the number of square feet it's got enough off street parking etc would that potentially also amount to a regulatory takings and is that your question Kurt? <laughs> maybe not mm -hmm. um, sounds pretty good i don't think that that would rise to the level of regulatory takings because you're not denying all economically viable uses of the property the question you'd have to answer is 
well, you could have a flagpole lot with a 20-foot wide flagpole that had a 14-foot wide driveway, 150 feet long, to a duplex, and that would be permissible underneath the code. And so what is the distinction or the difference between uh, somebody who uses a 20-foot wide alley to gain access to that same property, provided they are meeting all the other requirements of the code of providing off-street parking, they've got the, the minimum lot area that's required, um, and so th th that would that would maybe be the question is is can we make a distinction between the two that we think that limiting that use is is appropriate or necessary and can we make that determination in all you know in all cases just as a blanket um, limitation so but I don't think the the limitation of an expansion of use would be considered regulatory takings because um, they're still left with an economic economically viable use of the property. It's when you deny them anything um, that that certainly that would cross that line. Okay. So oh, is it my? Then, oh. Go ahead, and uh, then we'll go. So my understanding is that if if we pass the ordinance, the folks have no say or no kinds of hearings available to them about how someone might use a property. It and, but if it's under the non-conforming, if we leave it the way it is and and deal with some of these situations under the non-conforming uh, piece that people then have a, an opportunity for hearing? Okay, let's have Bill that try to address it's that. Really gonna, it would really depend upon how you address it. And if you just provided an exception in the non-conforming section, it will have the same effect. It will be a use by right. Um, unless you create a process um, under 6512 to have a condition use permit process to waive that requirement that's the only reason why you would have a hearing so if you if you waive that if you waive the requirement for the frontage standard for those existing lots they would have the same status as, as the lots around them that have that street frontage they would be able to do anything that's allowed within that what what other use uh, that is permitted in that district they would have the same rights as all the properties around them um, and so there would be no hearing, just like the neighbor next door, if they have a single family and it's a two-family district and they wanted to convert to a duplex, mm -hmm. they can do that without a hearing. Mm -hmm. um, so that property owner would just, by the accepting this one standard that they don't meet, would have the same property rights as everybody else in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think Joel had a quick, then yeah. I'll come back. I was going to respond to Bill's comment uh, uh, about the flagpole lot, that, uh, the distinction between uh, a uh, legal uh, flagpole, uh, creation of a legal fl flagpole lot, uh, thus expanding use uh, with a new lot, uh, and the uh, possibility of expanding use by uh, uh, putting a duplex on one of the lots we're talking about is that the lots we're talking about uh, are likely to have inadequate access, and the flagpole lot uh, would have to be a lot created on a standard street. <laughs> uh, I th did I understand you to suggest that the, the, the structure on the flagpole lot would be being serviced by a drive up the flagpole, which might be I equivalent in character to some of these more alley-like structures. That, that was, I guess, my suggestion. So if the hidden lane, for example, is very similar to flagpole lots that we have in that neighborhood of gaining access to the property via, you know, a narrow driveway, a 16-foot wide alley, for example. Um, and, but, but they're all going to be different. Every case, certainly, the circumstances could be different. So, okay. Does, does that? Well, yeah. So, so that's, yes, that's fine for now. <laughs> okay, that's fine for now. So, and so the problem with requiring a property owner to go through a hearing of any sort is that then it complicates their fire insurance, it complicates their mortgages. If if you say yes, you can rebuild, providing the results of the public hearing is a yes. Is that is that an accurate statement in the legal non-conforming? But there would be a way to work it out. Yeah. Okay. Does that yeah, if I may, I don't know about fire insurance, but um, lending mm -hmm. and the ability for a lender to have assurance that should they have a fire event, that the structure, you know, essentially what they have as uh, as an asset 
that uh, for the loan could be reconstructed in that on that property is the issue. We do get situations where lenders ask us for what they term a rebuild letter that is should it be destroyed we can rebuild this property so the insurance covers the, re the rebuild and essentially the, the lender has their asset back. Um, if it requires a kitchen condition use permit we can't issue that letter unless they've obtained that condition use permit. The property owner may then wish to try to go seek a condition use permit for that in advance and then so we're going to have everybody coming through a condition use permit and I, I don't know that I see one of those getting denied that we're going to deny them the opportunity to rebuild uh, those lots. And so essentially you've, you're making you know, them come through a CUP process to achieve something you could just do legislatively and alleviate that constraint on the property. Yeah. And one other quick question. So it's, it could possibly the distinction between a flagpole lot and, and these lots uh, be the, isn't the flagpole lot a private drive and, the, and we're talking public right-of-ways? That is the distinction, I guess, for the functional access that it provides and serves is somewhat similar, I yeah. mean, depending upon the, the situation. And they're, they're going to vary, um, but yes. Okay. Other discussion? I have one more question for Bill, but I want to invite Gregory. I, I had, a, I had a, a comment of this on this. <clears throat> it looks like in taking into account uh, what attorneys Landick and Forsyth uh, have presented and the, uh, the history of this to the extent we know the details of the history. For decades, the situation that we're dealing with was okay, where you had lots of budding alleys. Uh, provided, I'm, sh I'm sure you still had the building standards for having to make sure fire access and sewer and all those kind of things were in place. And given all the development that went on during those decades, it's in some ways remarkable there aren't more lots like this. But instead, we only have 20-odd. For whatever reason, in 1990, planning and zoning in the city council decided, well, we want to set this standard so they all have to abut public streets. And I don't know what their thought was of these lots at the time, whether there was any discussion of that, whether any of those property owners showed up to discuss it or even knew what was going on. But here we have the situation where what it looks like 24 years later is that, oops, we have a situation that probably wasn't intended. Maybe what, maybe it was, but it doesn't look like it was. And what we're trying to do is go back and fix that. Right now, you've got several lots where, in answer to the rebuild question, the answer, whether it burns down or whether a property owner just decides this house is too old, I want to knock it down and start over, the answer is no, you can't do that. Under the proposal that attorneys Landick and Forseth have put forward, the answer would be maybe. Everybody's expressed, you know, probably, but still there's the uncertainty of that. And through this process, by amending the code, what we're saying is to these lots that somehow got tangled up in this, the answer is yes. If you own a residential lot in a residential zone, uh, you can build a residence on it, provided it meets all the other standards. The only thing that we're saying is that uh, if if it was built and, and the access was fine when everybody approved, when the city initially approved the lots, that's not going to change. Um, I think this is the, the cleanest way to do this, to allow people to um, enjoy the rights that come with the property. Everybody on the similarly situated lots and similarly situated zones gets the same rights, and I think this is the best way to address that. Bill, I have a question for you to help remind the Commission uh, how this process might unfold. Tonight we would either recommend to Council approval of staff's recommended amendments or we would recommend to Council the non-approval of these. That's our move tonight, approve or recommend yes, recommend no, correct? Uh, typically if the Commission is, is not recommending an amendment, it does not move from the Commission to the Council. It won't move forward. On a legislative amendment, if you were doing a quasi-judicial hearing, if you're recommending denial of a rezone or a specific property request, then that owner has the right to continue on to the council. Uh, on legislative amendments, the commission can 
initiate legislative amendments. The council can initiate legislative amendments. Um, but if we wouldn't carry it forward if it's a recommended denial. On a legislative amendment, only, we only carry it forward to the council if you're recommending that the change be made. Okay. Um, and so if the commission, you have the options of recommending approval to the council, you have the options of tabling it, asking staff to provide you more information, or you have the option of deciding not to forward this on to the council for their consideration. There's a few others, but those, those are the main, okay. the main okay. options. It's, yeah. it's related to that. Um, would it also be possible to recommend the other route to putting in to putting this type of language in the non-conforming section? Sure. If you if you want staff Could to be. explore a different route, a different option okay. that was articulated by those that, that provided testimony or provided you with something in writing, you have that option to ask staff to go back, rework, bring a different draft back to you. The non-conforming section again I think depending upon how you handle it is going to be the exact same thing so it, it, I'd need to understand what is the difference that you want to see, what is the outcome that you want to see um, and then we can create the mechanism for that outcome but we need to understand what those parameters were I guess okay, let's, yeah, oh. Go ahead. oh I, I was just gonna say it it just seems to me it makes more sense to go through the non-conforming route because um, it it's that's what they are is they're non-conformities and otherwise we're looking at exceptions except you know here's the condition except for this I I don't know maybe they're the same but to me they don't quite seem the same <laughs> no, that non-conforming seems to describe the condition better okay. is that is that like a question to build I, it's like kind of a question I guess I'm wondering what he thinks about okay. that e either one would achieve I mean depending yeah. upon what you want the outcome to be if you want essentially to accept those lots and you just want to have the language in a different location then we could certainly do that um, the city attorney uh, is comfortable with the language that was presented if it has the same outcome then I guess I suggest maybe it would make sense that we could pick that up in a f upcoming update and not have to go through the public hearing process again through the amendment um, but I guess it depends if, if you're looking for the same mechanism, the same outcome. If you're looking for something different, um, then certainly we, would, we would, could look at it in a different manner. Kurt, did you? Yeah, so just to make sure we don't get done too soon, uh, <laughs> <laughs> how complex would it be? I mean, it seems like one of the, the biggest concerns with these lots is is are all density related, just in terms of small access you know not good access is it get overthinking it and getting too complicated to say well if you don't have the uh, standard uh, lot or you know frontage on a street or one of the other methods you know flagpole lot etc that it's can only be a single family residence I guess the question I'd have is is that we have multifamily developments that have parking off the alley and use the alley for access. Mm -hmm. Really, it's a primary point of access. A lot may front on a public street, but essentially it's, it's, that's how the property is accessed by the occupants of the structure. Uh, if you want to, but if you wanted to impose a limitation to single family, then my recommendation is we need to do further research to um, document for you on these 36 lots that were identified what are the uses that exist today? How many of those are more than single family? Um, so that we could better understand how many people we're going to potentially put into a non-conforming and who might lose, you know, that property right that they may currently have. Yeah. Um, so I would recommend that if that's a limitation that I would suggest that we make sure that we research that fully so we know the implications of the action before it gets forward onto the council. Right. So instead of taking a long time tonight, I could make it take a long time for six, seven weeks. Huh? It wouldn't take that long. Okay. Um, but we would. I would recommend that it be tabled and this evening, and that we complete that research, and then we bring that back to the commission for the commission's consideration. I just don't want to yeah. make one change that all of a sudden affects six property owners and yeah. places them in the exact same situation that we're trying to right. resolve as part right. of the code amendment. And so I just don't know. I just don't have firsthand knowledge of the 36 properties. What is currently there? Um, and what's more than a single family, what are the implications of that change? But that doesn't mean we can't look at that, but I just wouldn't want to do that this evening. Yeah. yeah. Um, other questions or thoughts? 
Make a movement, um, Greg. I'm sorry? He you suggested like Nels wants you to make a motion. Uh, I move that uh, we uh, propose that the City Council adopt the amendment uh, to Section 6.3 that's been uh, put forward. Second. Thank you, Nels. Any further discussion of the motion that we have on the table? I think Joel has something. Yes. I'm going to vote no because I would prefer to table it. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> and you would prefer to table it because what outcome would you like I, to see? I would uh, like to um, follow up on the uh, suggestions that was just made about uh, the possibility of of, of restricting a single family residence to a single family residence. <laughs> okay. So along the lines of your yeah. previous questions. Yes. Okay. Um, procedurally, Bill, will we hold another public hearing as a result if we table If we're tabled? Uh, I probably would recommend that we do another hearing. Okay. If it's going to affect the outcome. I guess, and and the content of the of the ordinance would so we would come back with a. Let me step back. So we would probably come back in a couple of weeks, uh, either the next meeting or the meeting after, and we could share what we learned. If it was going to change the the proposal, then we would re-notice it and we'd rehear it um, based on whatever that change was. Um, if it wasn't going to change the proposal then we probably wouldn't have to take additional public testimony or input and it could probably the council could or the commission could remove it from the table at a following meeting <laughs> and move a recommendation since the public hearing has been essentially closed and the and input's been gained. But if there's going to be any modification or any substantive change to the, to the draft, we need to re-notice it to provide the public the opportunity to provide a comment and input on that. So I, one quick question. Do you know offhand if any of these lots are multifamily? I think there are some two-family Hidden Lane has some. Mike is indicating that he believes there are some some duplexes on Hidden Lane. Um, I think maybe the one that's on the alley above C may have a duplex on the southernmost. I don't know about the northern northernmost. I mean, I know we have some structures that are not single-family. Yeah, okay. I, I, I'm fairly confident of that. As far as how many and where, I couldn't. I don't know. Okay. So, so then again, trying to be clear, I uh, appreciate your comment. Procedurally, an outcome could be that the current motion is defeated and we seek a new motion which could be to table, for example, uh, as, as one possibility. Uh, and I, and I want to make one other comment to you all. Um, I have valued working with you some longer than others. I have been on the short end of a couple of votes at times. This group has never become politicized, divided, held grudges or animosities. And so if we have a devote, divided <laughs> vote, <laughs> I, I want to recognize that the strength of this group has been the ability to have a yeah. laugh and go on. I don't think we've ever disagreed. Oh, oh my gosh. No, 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 we have disagreed, and we've even disagreed in votes. And we may do that again tonight. And I'm okay with that, and I think we should be able to be okay with that. Is there further discussion of the motion that we have on the floor, which is to recommend the um, language go forward to council? Yes, Deb. I think I would just like to acknowledge that having lived in the neighborhood that I have lived in for over 30 years, I'm having some guesses about why this is important to you. But I know when the thing, there have been some events in my own neighborhood that I haven't liked. But in the interest of fairness, I had to back away from the stance I wanted to take. Because I tried to imagine if, well, if it were my property, that's the bone of contention, what would I want to do with it? And what would I consider my rights? So 
I just would not like you to go away feeling like you're being disregarded if it doesn't go the way that you would like it to go, because um, I don't think that's the case. Um, well, that's all. Okay. Other discussion relative to the motion on the table? I guess I'll call a vote. Um, is there any reason to do it as a roll call, Bill? I just no, no, no particular no. reason. Okay. All those in favor of the motion on the floor to recommend this language forward to council, say aye. 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 I think I heard three. Okay. And opposed? Uh, no. Two, three, four, and I am also in doubt, so five. So we now have defeated that motion, and we are where we were. Okay, I, I move that uh, we um, table the issue uh, to return to it in uh, a near future meeting, and that uh, staff address the issues of uh, existing uses of the uh, uh, properties that we're discussing, uh, and the possibility of moving the language to uh, um, the uh, uh, non-conforming use uh, section and other things that anyone else would like to add to that? I would second what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> are, are, are we fairly clear what the motion is? The, 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 effect, the, the specific effect is to table tonight's work. And then the direction to staff is what I want to be clear. That's yeah. me too. And, 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 yeah. <laughs> you too. Okay. And can we ask staff to do the research about about multifamily, single family? If there's a route out to let existing multifamilies remain, but uh, make any future development on these lots into single family if they don't have adequate frontage we can certainly research it research the uh, uses the ability so what we could yeah. do is we will inventory of the 36 lots we identified we'll inventory the current existing uses on the property so we'll try to identify uh, without going inside the buildings but try to identify from what we what we know uh, whether single family two family or, or multi-family structures the um, and then we can certainly talk about the ability of, of whether there was a limitation on on an undeveloped lot to a single family, um, but the it's likely the the proposal would be that if it's a multifamily, if it were destroyed, it would go back to a single family because that that same you want to make sure that you are imposing the same standard on all the same lots yeah. that have the same condition. Yeah. And so you're not going to be able to provide them a exception to that standard. I, it wouldn't be our recommendation that you provide them with an exception in perpetuity. Yeah. yeah. And so that would be if you wanted to treat it in, in a non-conforming manner, such as that, um, then essentially they probably would all have the single-family limitation. Yeah. They could continue as existing non-conforming uses, um, but should they be destroyed, they would have to reduce their potentially reduce their use to a single family dwelling. You know, we'll have to see how the language yeah, yeah. shakes yeah. up. But but in my that would be my general recommendation so that all properties that are similarly situated have the same limitations. And some of these properties are going to be in single family districts, so it's not going to be a as much of a concern because if that was destroyed, if it's a two family and if it's destroyed, it's going to have to go single family anyhow upon reconstruction. It'll be those lots that are going to be located in multifamily, which we do have uh, several, um, or in a two family district where we'll have that um, issue arise and um, you know our recommendation would be if you wish to limit those then it should be limited to all of them so that it is the same and equitable standard that's applied in uniformity across properties that have the same condition yeah. and uh, then they will while they're non-conforming today potentially in the context of, of street frontage they would be essentially non-conforming in the limitation of use that they're yeah. that that exception would contain and so that's likely what we would recommend to the commission. And, uh, but we can see, so there, there would be some, 
you're relieving the nonconformity of one standard, but you're going to be imposing nonconformity on another. And that will just, we'll have to see how many properties that affects and whether that's the direction the commission would like to go. Yep. And, and maybe some opinion on if that's in, in, in any, any danger of being considered a taking. I don't think that is in any yeah. danger. I mean, somebody can make the claim, but yeah. I don't know that it's in, you know, and I certainly will visit with the city attorney to confirm that, but my layman's view of that would be that, you know, you're still allowing an economic use of the property. Um, the question becomes the rationale and the nexus between the limitation, and can you support that rationale and nexus where you may otherwise approve a similar use today just on a flagpole lot that has a similar yeah. means of access? So I'll just be, those will be things we'll have to talk through if yeah. you want to impose that limitation. Okay. Okay. I would like to see Kurt's issue included in my motion. Oh, yeah. Okay. I think staff yeah. has clear direction now. Okay. okay. So you feel comfortable with some direct, with having adequate direction? I do. Okay. So Is that just direction. We don't need to vote on that. That just direction to well, staff. Well, I, I think that this motion to table contains a collection of direction to staff. Right. Right. Yes. All, all within it. And, and so we will vote on the motion to table and instruct staff as follows. Is that yes. clear? It's good with me. Okay. And again, we could decide that we don't want a table. We wish to go somewhere else yet. So that's a possibility. Um, or that we wish to table, but we wish to instruct staff differently. <laughs> All right, so we have a motion and a second. All in favor of the motion to table tonight? May I, can I make Great, have some discussion first on the yes, motion? Yes, certainly. Sorry. Thanks. Um, the only comment I want to make is that um, I, I, I don't want to see this die. I think it's something that in the two meetings prior to this we've discussed it in. It's something that we've recognized is important and needs to be dealt with. Obviously, it's important to city staff, to the city attorney, because there's uh, – maybe not a present problem, but a real problem that's that's looming out there. Um, again, we had two meetings with where we had discussion on this, no input. Uh, the input we've had tonight, uh, the, the, the issue is whether it's going to make an exception for lots that abut streets, or excuse me, alleys rather than streets. None of the discussion addressed that standard or that issue or why it's a good idea to abut streets rather than alleys. Um, really, it, it, what I see this coming down to, and I, what I don't want to see it come down to, is a group of neighbors who have particular objection to certain lots being developed, and, and it turns into a, a situation where um, the, the process is being used to do that. I, I don't want to see that happen. I, this, this should be, um, whatever we decide should apply equally to all the lots in the situation without regard to their their current circumstances. I, I agree with you that I feel like it needs to be dealt with if I were one of the property owners of a house in a non-conforming situation and it burned down, I'd want to be able to rebuild without going through a conditional use. I mean, it, it just seems like the fair thing to do. And that's, even though I have a sh had a shadow of doubt when I voted, I mean, it's a difficult circumstance and I, I guess I appreciate that we're going for, you know, we're, we're tabling it and having a little more discussion, I still think about those 26 odd property owners who are in that circumstance, and, and I think we need to deal with it, so. Yeah. Any other comments before we vote? Well, I think the discussion has certainly brought a few issues to the table that we might have talked about earlier had we uh, thought more uh, deeply about it. So I think the discussion's been pretty good. And uh, so I, I think I'm happy with the way we're going. All right then. All in favor of the motion to table and instruct staff, say aye. 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 Opposed? Distensions. All right. Mr. Yes, Mr. Belknap. Five minute recess. Yes, let's take a <laughs> five minute <laughs> recess until nine oh five by that clock.
Oh, oh, sorry, but I, 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 oh. Oh, so okay. we got the knock. So we're back on the air. She's just. Um, and if I could find the agenda, we are working on the next public hearing. Not Can that. we make this into a three-hour deal? <laughs> 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 oh, I've got two copies of the same thing. This is what's really confusing. Me. <laughs> um, this is, Mike, this is the one relative to fence standards. Correct. Thank you. The public hearing, the proposed amendment, Title IV, Chapter 2, 3, and 6, regarding fence height and placement standards. Mike. Thank you again, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the Commission. So next we have a uh, le proposed legislative amendment to the city code, and this is regarding fence height and placement standards of, of fences. Um, just to give you a little bit of background, we had some concern expressed from a fence contractor at a prior city council meeting, uh, basically expressing concern that existing six-foot-tall fences within street side yards, uh, which currently within our regulations are not allowed to be uh, rebuilt as such. You're allowed to build a three-foot solid or four-and-a-half-foot picket fence in your front yards, uh, it's actually anywhere on your property, but we prohibit uh, six-foot tall fences or anything over three feet solid or four-and-a-half foot picket uh, to be located within a front yard or a street side yard. And so um, what happened was there's uh, apparently some property owners that had uh, built these fences in the 60s. Uh, subsequently, we had uh, amended some city code in order to uh, prohibit these to be located in the street side yard. Um, and they were getting about that age to be replaced. And so there was some concern that they wouldn't be able to uh, replace those fences in their present location. And so council directed staff to research the issue and possibly bring forward a legislative amendment. Uh, this was reviewed uh, the past previous two meetings by Planning and Zoning Commission uh, and directed staff to prepare a legislative amendment. And we did a little bit of research on this matter and, and noticed that seven variance requests uh, were proposed over the past 10 years of those seven. Uh, all of them were approved. Two were limiting the fence to five feet in height uh, instead of the six feet, and then those other five uh, basically allowed six feet in height uh, within those street side yards. And so we also compared six other municipalities uh, within the region. We had Pullman, Lewiston, Post Falls, Boise, Coeur d'Alene, and Spokane. Uh, we noticed that uh, within their regulations that none of those municipalities restricted fence height within the street side yard. So um, uh, com examples of similarities were that six feet in height is the typical maximum height uh, that was uh, within their regulations. And so taking a look at the existing language, uh, pretty consistent within the f uh, farm ranch, suburban residential, R1, R2, R3, R4, residential office and neighborhood business zoning districts. Uh, within each zoning district, uh, those specific ones, you have the fence regulations which are included at the end, so they're duplicated uh, basically after each section. And so uh, just like I had uh, iterated at the beginning, uh, basically no fence shall exceed six feet in height except fences located on school grounds. Uh, the second regulation is that uh, fence, fences constructed within front and street side yards can't exceed that three-foot solid or four-and-a-half-foot picket. We also state that uh, within the, for the picket requirement or open fences, uh, the post and the material can't constitute more than one-third of the fence area. So basically that would mean if you had a two-inch wide picket, you would have to have uh, four inches of space in between <coughs> that, that area. So. Um, next, barbed wire fences or other fences constructed in a manner that would be hazardous to a persons or animals, those are prohibited. And uh, solid fences installed on top or within five feet of fill retaining walls that are built at a site or rear property line should not exceed uh, the height of six feet minus one half of the elevation difference between the height and the low sides of the wall. And that's just to uh, prohibit, you know, large, say you had a, a uh, a four foot tall retaining wall and you build a six foot tall fence on top of that uh, the neighbor uh, to that side would probably not be that happy to have a, a large wall uh, restricting its view so that's why that regulation exists uh, looking at central business general business and motor business uh, commercial zones uh, we have these regulations basically stating that no fence shall exceed six feet in height you also have the um, 
barbed wire fences uh, are not allowed either. Industrial zoning district, uh, the only zoning district that allows us to go above six feet in height, uh, specified that uh, you can't construct it greater than eight feet, so you gain an additional two feet. And then it also allows barbed wire to be affixed to top of the fence uh, for security purposes, and as long as it's over six feet in height above ground level. And so. Uh, the, other, the only other uh, zoning district uh, we speak of fences is urban mixed commercial and uh, just because of the pedestrian bicycle nature, mixed use nature of that zoning district, uh, we have specific regulations uh, within that zone. So it gets us to the proposed language, uh, basically including, uh, th this would be shifting all of the fence regulations duplicated in each of the subsequent sections of the zoning code. We pull all those out and we put those in uh, section or chapter six of uh, the zoning code um, and drop it in under, under fences here so it would be in one location. We didn't have to search for it under the specific uh, zoning districts. And so uh, the first subsection would be A. And looking at uh, fences may be constructed after obtaining a permit from the city. All fences shall comply with the following standards. And so uh, we're just stating that they're required to obtain a permit, and this is to be able to review uh, for comp compliance with our regulations. But currently we don't uh, state that within our, our code that a fence permit is required. So it's a little unclear. So the first subsection under uh, Section A Basically complying with the following standards, uh, fences within all zoning districts except for the industrial zoning district should not exceed six feet in height, uh, except carrying this over. Uh, fences located on school grounds, public parks, public utility facilities, and similar public facilities. Also goes on to state the fences should not exceed eight feet in height within the, that industrial zoning district, so we're keeping that the same. Uh, fences within the farm ranch, suburban residential, R1 through R4, uh, RO and NB zoning districts shall comply with the following standards. Uh, basically, you know, fences constructed within the front yards, and so we're accepting out the street side yards here. It's basically just for front yards that they can't exceed the three feet in height, uh, the four and a half foot. Um, height for picket or open fences. We're also going to include, um, or proposing to include, uh, the post material constitute not more than 60% of the fence area. Um, you know, it's been uh, common practice to tell customers that the typical 50 50, so four inch picket and four inch opening, is typically what you see for picket fences. Um, you don't see anything, you know, really any larger than that. Uh, instead of 50 50, you know, some people choose to put horse tack or some other wire fencing material behind that, as well as any horizontal uh, structural support thought that that would cover those aspects of a fence that could be arguable that it may be over 50 percent and so uh, we went to 60 percent as the proposed uh, percentage on, on this requirement. Once again, keeping the solid fences installed of on top of or within five feet of the fill retaining walls just to uh, prohibit creation of this, you know, just large uh, mass stockade effect uh, of a fence and a combination of a uh, retaining wall and then the, you know subsection three this is basically just carrying over the same language that we currently have in the urban mixed commercial zoning district just placing it within uh, this one one chapter uh, moves on to four uh, fences over three feet in height shall be set back a minimum of two feet from adjacent public sidewalks or seven feet from the back of the street curb if no sidewalk exists you know seven feet because our, our currently adopted uh, sidewalk standard is five feet and that's to achieve that two feet separation of that and that's for mainly uh, safety purposes you know a, a kid with a, a bicycle and handlebars uh, could knock into the fence and be a safety issue and then uh, you have other safety issues snow you know snow removal from the sidewalk uh, there's those aspects of that leads us on to subsection five um, streets or fences located within street intersection site triangles shall be constructed in accordance with city standard construction specifications and drawings as adopted by city council and so um, those have been adopted. We have our site triangle, which basically uh, curb line projected on a corner lot. You go back 40 feet one direction, you go back 40 feet on the other direction, and you, and you draw a, uh, basically a triangle. Uh, and within that area, uh, fences are and 
uh, shrubs and trees, for that matter, are limited to three feet in height, and that's to view oncoming traffic from a street intersection, you know, for, to keep the safety there. And then also stating uh, that any fence proposed to be located within a public right-of-way shall require the issuance of an encroachment permit, which is, you know, basically just stating uh, what's required right now if you're going to place a fence within that area. And a lot of times we run into issues where a lot of the early platted streets are 80-foot right-of-ways. And so um, if somebody wants to build a fence up to the sidewalk, then that means that, you know, we're two feet away from the sidewalk. That means they're going to be constructing the fence within the public right-of-way, and they have to go through that process basically to say that, you know, if the city goes in and winds the road at some point in time, uh, they can tear down the fence and wouldn't have to replace it. And then that leads us on to the last uh, portion of this uh, proposed new chapter. Basically, barbed wire fences or other fences constructed in a manner that may be hazardous to persons or animals are prohibited in all zoning districts except for the industrial district. Uh, barbed wire fences within the industrial keep in that same language that uh, if it's above six feet in height uh, from ground level, you can have that for the top two feet. So. With that, um, that's a summary of the proposed language, and I'd certainly be happy to answer any questions you might have about it. Okay. Uh, questions for Mike? Mr. Chairman, if I might, just to clarify the changes that occurred since the last time you looked at it, <clears throat> the first of which was the universal application of that separation from the sidewalk. We did allow, if it was only three feet high, for it to be the back of the walk, so a very low picket fence doesn't seem to have the same crowding effect, so that was still permissible. Uh, but if you get over three feet and you start to get into handlebar zone, um, then you'd have to be back that two feet from the back of the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. uh, the other discussion item under our number five, we talked and we previously had kind of a narrative description about a retaining wall or a natural grade of the ground in a site triangle where the fence additional height limitations or setback limitations may be required. It just so happens we have a diagram in the standard uh, construction drawings that illustrates that. Uh, situation and establishes and shows how the fence height would have to be reduced. So we just made reference to that standard that already exists with that illustration that already exists, and that seemed to be the easiest way for us to address that item. So those were the two uh, changes that were made since the last time that you saw this. Thank you. Questions regarding the proposal here? Does that then uh, your, uh, item number four, um, does that uh, then mean that uh, you could construct a three-foot fence immediately at the edge of a sidewalk? If your property line went to the sidewalk and we discussed that you, some of the newer subdivisions that have narrower right-of-way widths, the 50-foot right-of-way widths, you could put that three-foot fence up to the sidewalk. If you were looking for an encroachment permit from the Public Works Department, they're going to request that that and require that that be at least one foot off, even if your property line goes up, um, if your property line does not go up to the sidewalk. So a three-foot fence under this language would be permissible to be up to the back of the walk. <clears throat> I guess I'm bothered by that. Uh, I, yeah, I'd prefer to have at least some setback. Uh, if nothing else, it's uh, uh, a three-foot fence can interact badly with a wheelchair user's hands. <laughs> so uh, let's let's continue the discussion yeah. as as we get to that point in our public hearing process. But thank you for the clarification that shorter fences could come all the way up to the sidewalk in some set situations. Okay. Other questions for Mike? Right. With that, thank you, Mike. I am going to open the public hearing and call for testimony in favor of the amendments. First of all, your friends. <laughs> Come on up. Name and address and help us understand. Okay. My name is Patrick O'Connell, and my address is 228 South Cleveland. It's a little late in Moscow and I'm in favor of it because of the situation as Bill and Mike had told a lot of these fences that were built earlier are starting to fail now and a lot of the people situations they're elderly 
the yard's been established. Um, landscaping, sprinkler heads, everything's been put in. And uh, from talking last time, I really don't think on the side yards, when we showed all those examples, I, I think people on corner lots, they really weren't able to use their lots like everybody else because of the situation they bought on a corner lot. So I'm happy that, that hopefully, you know, this passes and, and that will solve that. Um, I don't know if it's time to talk right now, uh, Bill, when you were talking about the three-foot fence going up to the sidewalk. As a contractor, I, I think it would be easy to say keep it one foot off because if those sidewalks ever have to get repaired, then the <laughs> contractor who's setting his two-by-four forms now has to deal with pickets, concrete that holds the the four-by-fours in. And I think nobody's going to, I think, object to saying one foot off of sidewalk for uh, courtesy of anybody dealing with uh, the four foot uh, situation. So, um, my only other concern was when I was saying that thing about the the bob wire fences. There is some of these active uh, lots I see all around town where they have the animal rights and they have horses in there. So, it's not zoned industrial. So these people do have bob wire up to keep their livestock in, and they have that right too. So that's an issue that I saw. Bill, uh, the way the language reads, it says barbed wire fences or other fences constructed in an area that may be hazardous to persons or animals are prohibited, so long as it's in a manner that's not hazardous to persons. Um, generally, for livestock situations, we have permitted that. Um, so as long as it's not immediately adjacent to a sidewalk, a setback from the sidewalk, so it's not in, in a position where we present a hazard to the public, we have not um, prohibited those. Excuse me. Sorry. Sorry my, my mic was off. <laughs> Thank I you. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, questions for Pat? So, Pat, the situations that you're aware of perhaps for potential clients this this amendment would meet their needs yeah it would i uh, the fences are exactly right where somebody would have thought they would have been years ago and i i see everybody's point of view i mean i don't think it's in good taste to put it a six-foot fence in front of a house from an architectural point of view or um, so I think you're you're fine with that in terms of your three foot or your four foot with fifty percent, or and I guess now you've increased it sixty percent because a lot of times people will put on welded wire back there to keep the dogs in if it's a split rail fence or a picket fence. Um, I just think from everybody that's been talking to me, and it's an issue that's come over and over and over and over again. People that are on corner properties. They really don't have any use of their property. Mm -hmm. It's like a boomerang that goes around, and like uh, it, it, it's not just it's not just fences. It's like decks with enclosed, maybe vinyl fences around the deck. I mean, you walk out of their back patio door, and they it's almost like a little prison yard back there because they can't use their side yard at all. So I guess that's maybe, uh, you know, they bought the, the corner property. But still we've been talking about all night long about people being able to use their property, except if it's a corner lot. You know? <laughs> <laughs> One more question I would have. You were suggesting that we amend, I think it's number four, fences over three feet height must be set back two feet. Th to recognize the shorter fences, one foot, or the one foot setback. Oh, I, I'm talking, uh, you were talking about uh, people 
in the front yards going up to the right. It was, yeah, I, think I, Joe, I just threw that in because I think it would help solve a problem for somebody who's laying out a sidewalk. A practical problem a practical for solution a future would be builder an easy thing, is setback held off 12 inches from edge of sidewalk. Uh -huh. Just because you have to surround a four by four with a concrete right, a, footing, right? Yeah. Um, and I'm sure that a lot of these, you know, I've dealt with a lot of concrete people. You know, they're kind of gruff and they don't want to deal with <laughs> the particulars of a very nice <laughs> lattice fence or anything. <laughs> <laughs> going down. <laughs> so. would, would two feet rather than one foot be <laughs> objectionable? Oh, I'm just, you know, there's be a symmetry yeah. in the language. I, I, I don't know how objectionable that would be a foot or two. It depends how, how large the frontage is, but I mean, two feet would allow you a nice planter strip, but then we're in the situation if their plant material starts growing onto the right. sidewalk. Then we're, we're back to it's where you problem. were with the, the junipers of going over the curb, you know, what was that last year at the time? Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, I think a foot would be reasonable because okay. they could always leave that option themselves if they want to set it back, back to two feet further for that two foot planter strip. Further questions for Pat? Thank you. Okay, thanks. Testimony, more testimony uh, in favor of the ordinance. Testimony in opposition. <laughs> testimony of a general nature. <laughs> Victoria Siever, 121 North Lily. So I do have a few comments. Um, well, I think that it's uh, nicer and just fine to want wider walks in newly constructed area and even preferable where there's plenty of room. Not all properties, particularly in the older sections of town, fit that profile. Um, I find it interesting that while you guys talk about the shrinking lot sizes and smaller yards that the trend is going toward, you seem to want to watch, want sidewalks that are about a mile wide, uh, to exaggerate. Um, two people can absolutely walk side by side on a four-foot sidewalk. And there are many walks in town, especially the older part of town, where, uh, where you see that. I live in high density. I see it all the time. And sometimes these guys are pretty big guys, you know. Uh, I see people pushing their stroller in front of them. I see people walking together, and they've got a kid or a dog. And they're not prohibited from walking on a sidewalk because it's only four feet. Uh, probably 10 years ago, I had a neighbor friend who was in one of those uh, wheelchair, scooter things, whatever. She couldn't walk. She'd come down on my sidewalk and visit me while I'm in the yard. She didn't have any problem with a four-foot sidewalk. And she was not a small woman. So uh, I just want to caution. So even though I, I agree we want to be AD serviceable and all that, I, I want to caution against misrepresenting the good old four-foot sidewalk because there are a lot of them in town and, and you could be impacting them because we come to number four and that's, that's my other common area. Um, I can't remember exactly, but it seems like when this first start, first was brought up, you were talking about if you do this in a lot of the older properties that have the fences that go up to the sidewalk, all of a sudden they're non-conforming. And I, that worries me. That bothers me to put people into a non-conforming situation. Um, the, it isn't just, and I'm really glad that you changed this to a three-foot sidewalk could come up or a three-foot fence could come up to the sidewalk. My issue is not the fence. My issue is that two foot of space that you want to put in between. Uh, I, ha I have a retaining wall. See, there is the retaining wall issue. My retaining wall is 22 inches at the highest place and goes down to nothing at the other end of the yard. So uh, I, I'm, I'm much happier with being able to, to go up that you should be able to go up to the sidewalk. I don't want to cause problems and put for people or put them in non-conforming situations uh, for a nicety because, yes, it's nice to have that extra two feet, but I'm not sure that it's necessary. And I want to be careful about that. Um, I'm not moving my retaining wall, <laughs> so <laughs> it has to be there. 
So anyway, that that was the comments that I wanted to bring up. The two comments. Okay. okay. Questions for Victoria? So Victoria, to clarify, your concern since we are not Before. addressing sidewalks right now at all. No, but you're talking about the fences coming up to the sidewalk. Uh, but but it would not. be on number four, the yeah. seven feet back from curb, which I think staff's intention was to allow space for the yeah. five-foot sidewalk that they envision, mm -hmm. and then the two feet. And you're s perhaps suggesting that a four-foot sidewalk, and therefore six feet back from the curb, might be adequate. Is that what I'm understanding? I wasn't especially concerned. I suppose that would be correct. I was more concerned about, I already, ha I have a tree lawn. I'm not at the curb. I have a 10-foot tree lawn, you know, and then a four-foot sidewalk, and then a short retaining wall that holds mm -hmm. the yard in place, you know. Mm -hmm. It's not there for decoration. Uh, so, and I don't have a fence. The only fence I ever had was a little tiny foot wire thingy to keep people from crossing across up the fence, down the fence, I, I, up the wall, down the wall. Why they would do that to cut the corner, I don't know. But until I got est uh, plants established to stop people from doing that, discourage them, uh, I had a little tiny fence. But I don't plan on putting a fence there, but you know, you, you can, I'm, it, it's not impossible that that might happen at some point. And so, I just, and there are a few other fences in the neighborhood that come up to the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. I don't want to put people in a non-conforming situation or cause a hardship for people because you want that extra two feet. Okay. And that, that's, that's the thing I want you to consider. And that four foot wide sidewalks aren't as bad as you sometimes make out to be. Okay. Okay. Other questions for Victoria? Thank you. Other testimony of a general nature? Want to bat again, Pat? Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> then. It's a lot of burden just to bid the job, huh? Okay. Uh, with that, let's close the public hearing and invite the commission to discuss amongst themselves what it would like to do with this proposal. I have a, oh, well, I have a, I have a question in light of uh, Ms. Siever's comment and then in light of the discussion we had earlier tonight, how many non-conforming uses are we unintentionally creating with this? Are we back here in six months because people find out that their fences are now illegal? So the Turn my mic on. Sorry, I'm getting a little punchy here. Um, so if you had a fence that didn't meet this standard, um, it would be allowed to remain, and it would just, at the time that you're going to replace it, you would have to adjust it to meet the new standard. And the level of investment that you typically have in a fence is considerably different than the level of investment you have in a home or a dwelling. So so I don't think we're, we're going to see a significant... Uh, issue arise. Largely, the amendment is is expanding opportunities. The only place that um, we have a new limitation would be kind of that separation from the sidewalk. And so if there are instances, and, and we do have most often fairly, you know, we kind of showed some photographs of existing fences that were in street side yards when we were talking about specifically the height in street side yard areas. Um, we've not done a full inventory of if we're, you know 10,000 lost to look at front fences and how they how they uh, are adjacent or separated from the sidewalk um, personally a, sh a short picket fence up against the walk doesn't seem you know, doesn't bother me the it, we when it starts getting four four and a half feet high then you know it does tend to start to crowd against the uh, f the front property line or against the sidewalk where you could have you know a open fence at four and a half feet um, right up against the sidewalk, essentially. And so this separation would, would create some, the required separation would provide that separation from the sidewalk. So, 
you know, I, I can't answer the question of how many locations do we have fences directly adjacent to the street. In most instances, in the front yard areas where we most often encounter sidewalks adjacent to fences, they tend to be narrow, uh, fairly short picket fences if they're out that far. Um, and again, your property line has to extend out that far or you have to have, have been granted an encroachment permit to construct it in the right of way. If you've gotten, if you've received a, an encroachment permit, you're going to be held back at a minimum of one feet, um, <coughs> which is the current standard uh, that Public Works has when they're doing encroachment permits. The otherwise, you're on your property line, and you may be some three, four, five, six feet back from the sidewalk, uh, depending upon the right of way width in that particular case. So, um, so I don't think we're going to at risk of creating. We're actually we're going to we're going to relieve some existing nonconformities relating to fences, heights, and side street side yard setbacks, and I don't think we're going to impose, um, depending on whatever the language is that the commission settles on, as this language is drafted, I don't think you're going to have many nonconformities that would be created as a result of this, and the public benefit of encouraging fences to be slightly set back from the sidewalk over time is a minimal inconvenience to benefit the public of not being crowded or, or catching a handlebar on a fence or something like that. So. Um, I, I'm not concerned about that aspect myself. And if I understood, just to follow up, if I understood from the discussions we had before in the places, I think it's mostly Fort Russell, where the city, where the street is actually um, overlaps the property line and the city had to get right of ways, or rights of way to, or excuse me, easements to do that. Those people can build up to the sidewalk. Actually, those are in the opposite condition. The right-of-way goes up to the building wall, and they have to get an encroachment permit to place a fence up there. Yeah. The ones where we have <clears throat> our newer subdivisions, where we had 50-foot right-of-ways for the 28-foot wide street that resulted in pins in the sidewalks. That was Indian Hill 6 and Anderson Edition, Frontier, and some of those, where we had the narrow 50-foot um, right-of-way with 10-foot easements beyond that to fit the roadway, the tree lawn, the sidewalk, and then the franchise utilities beyond that. And those are going to be the neighborhoods where you'll have that their property actually goes 18 inches into the sidewalk or some distance, approximately that distance. And so, you know, it is their property up to the back of the walk. And that's where you're going to see most often where those may occur. Um, in most other neighborhoods where you have 60 or 7 foot or even 80 foot right of ways, then that property line has uh, held fences back over time just because it's they've been placed on the property line. Um, but, I mean, there's there's no doubt there's going to be some fences that you'll find that are going to be up against the walk that if you wanted to have a, re a requirement that fences three feet and less, you know, all fences have a separation requirement, when they get replaced will have to be moved back a little bit. Um, but that's not a – most most property owners will be understandable about that and getting some separation from the sidewalk and just being able to swing a shovel while you're shoveling snow on the sidewalk. Um, it was the side yard height limitations where you had to be 17 feet in on your property before you could have a <laughs> six-foot fence. Uh, those are the ones where people were not as happy. Okay, thanks. Other else? What about plantings? Uh, what about uh, uh, rows of arborvitaes? We don't regulate vegetation or you plants. We don't regulate it. So it could be in a sunny place. You can find them around. And if you remember that, the house on Hayes. First in Hayes? Yeah. <laughs> remember that one? Now, I mean, uh, that those grew up to be 20 feet high. So we're not regulating that. But, boy, you couldn't, uh, you know, it's... it's and I might say we don't regulate it from the perspective of zoning, but the site triangle and site obstructions. Site triangle, uh, I think you finally got to them. Not me, not us. Not you. <laughs> somebody, somebody must have. City engineer. <laughs> yeah. So we're not uh, going to talk about uh, plantings at all, just going to ignore it. Mm -hmm. The zoning code currently does, correct. <laughs> Uh, so One of the things about setting things back, just a little odd uh, thing for those people who have um, walls, I'm looking at it with uh, my sister's place on 3rd. The wall seems is built right to the sidewalk. 
and now if the wall starts to fall down and you have to replace it, I am trying to figure out how we're going to deal with the, you know, if it had been a foot back from the sidewalk, it would be pretty easy. But I'm, it's going to be interesting to see what happens when the wall comes out. And, I mean, you know, if you have a wall, are you now taking a responsibility for city sidewalks as well? Do you see what I'm getting at? There aren't that many of them, but when they're there, they're they're fairly significant. And I, I just we haven't gotten. I think we're getting ready because we had a wall that uh, came down in the last. You know, one of those walls that's basically eighty, ninety years old, and it started falling down. But it's right against the sidewalk, and I'm not sure where the property line is. To be honest with you, I'm not sure I'm not either. about in, that. In conjunction with the retaining walls, in our discussion last time, you were talking about um, mitigating the ability for somebody to put a fence right on top of that wall so that you essentially have, in certain locations, so you essentially have this really tall structure right next to somebody on the sidewalk. What happened to that? So, so in, in answering Victoria's question, would the ordinance allow uh, somebody with a retaining wall to put their fence right on top of that if it's a front yard or side yard? Or is there some height mitigation thing you were starting to t address last time that I don't see right now? 2B on the section of the ordinance, section 2B. Uh, it's actually not on the screen, but it's in the ordinance that's in the packet. Um, addresses fences placed on top of retaining walls. Right. So it has that aspect. The more detailed conversation we had the last meeting was regarding the site triangle, okay. and we were limiting fences to no more than 36 inches in the site triangle, and then the question was raised, what if that is on top of a retaining wall, or what if that is on top of a slope, not even a retaining wall, just a natural right, three-to-one, right. three-to-one slope that elevates that fence above. We have a diagram that addresses all of those conditions in the um, standard specifications and, and drawings. And so item number five brought the reference of if you're in the side triangle, then you have to comply with those standards. Okay. And that was the really the cleanest way for us to address them. Okay. So there's a picture that, te that tells you what to do? There is saying? a picture. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's, it shows the elevation measured to the reference to the, the crown of the road and shows that if you have a natural slope, you have to cut it back, or if it's fences on there, it has to be reduced to where the total height isn't above, 36 inches above the crown of the roadway. Um, so it addresses that situation, both retaining walls and natural slope grades, and shows that in the site triangle, that fence height has to be limited so that in combination, those two components don't rise above 36 inches over the crown of the roadway. Mm. I would like to get a motion on the table, okay. and uh, uh, my motion will uh, um, require some changes to item number four. Uh, I still, I still think that at least one foot of uh, uh, of setback uh, from a sidewalk is desirable. So I uh, suggest that we uh, uh, accept the. Uh, proposed language with the exception of item number four where item number four is modified that uh, uh, say that fences uh, shall be set back at least uh, one foot uh, from sidewalk or six feet from uh, a uh, the from the back of the street curb, or uh, if, the, uh, if the fence exceeds uh, three feet, uh, two feet, and seven feet, as the language currently shows. So uh, one, foot, one foot setback uh, for uh, uh, fences uh, of uh, uh, less than three feet and two feet of setback uh, for uh, fences uh, greater than that. Taller. And, and and the correspond and correspondingly add, shifted add, 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 five, add five feet. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, my motion is to ex accept the uh, proposed language with uh, that modification. Uh, Bill has a comment, but I think I'd like to see if there's a second for that. Before. Second. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So we have that. Yes. Um, for the purposes of simplicity, uh, can we? Would it one and six be acceptable for all? 
I would just to keep it really as simple as possible right now, the Public Works Department is allowing fences up to one foot from the sidewalk currently, kind of regardless of height. Is there any sense of we could live with one and six for all fences, and then we could just strike the over three feet in height and, and change it to one and six? I, you know, just mm -hmm. I'm looking for yeah. something yeah, yeah. that doesn't involve calculus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and the consequence of that would be if the sidewalk were subsequently constructed, we would get a four foot sidewalk <laughs> rather than a five foot sidewalk if we were going to maintain the one foot. Right. No, so, if so you have six, six feet, feet back from the curb, correct. But oh, okay, we'd only get one foot of space <laughs> in all in all cases. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. I prefer the two feet, but or two feet universally. Yeah, it would just two. be nice to have a yeah. singular standard if you're going to have a separation, just to make yeah. it simple and clear so everybody understands. Well, why is it that you don't like the two feet? And I'll say it again. Two feet. You. <laughs> well, because the two feet uh, uh, t takes away from uh, somebody's backyard. <laughs> so we're talking about trying uh, trying try, try to allow more Shot more you. more space uh, inside the fence. <laughs> and this was, I mean, y your initial motion was relative to the short fences, yeah. stepping them back one foot. And right. now we've gotten this. Right. Larger idea of stepping back yes. all fences one foot. Yeah, right. Can't be Rather than if, <laughs> if, if people are feet. willing to have a three foot fence, they can have more backyard <laughs> or side yard <laughs> or front yard. <laughs> and it doesn't matter whether this is on a, the public right of way or whether it's on their private property, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, no, so it, they would have to get an encroachment permit to allow it to be located in the right of way, and they're not going to be able to get closer to one foot from the sidewalk with an encroachment permit. That's just the clearance that Public Works is holding to right now. Um, so, correct. If it's if their property line comes up to 12 inches from the back of the walk, or it's five feet back and they're getting encroachment for that four feet, that standard, that, that just minimum separation would apply. Yep. So I like one and six, and if it brings it into what the public works encroachment limits are right now, that seems like a really good idea to be using the same numbers everywhere. I would prefer one and one fit universally rather than two feet universally. <laughs> okay. So I think that may require us either to reject uh, your motion or for the two, you and Deb, to agree to revise your motion such go that. Go ahead, revise okay, it. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll go with one, one foot. Uh, uh, you, one foot and six feet. Uh, right. So, so, so you would change number four to read: fences shall be set back a minimum of one foot from sidewalk or six feet from back of curb. Yeah. Uh, with no height mentioned in there. Yes. All fences. Fences can't be. Is that clear to staff? Is that clear to everyone here? Yes. So all fences set back a minimum of one feet or six feet. Sure, we don't want to go one foot seven and three eighths. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, we have uh, an amended motion and a second. I'm looking at Deb, she nods again. Um, any further discussion of the motion to recommend to council this change? All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. Thank you. People can add chicken wire to the top of their fence without having to move it back. <laughs> Thank you. That's all right. I can rearrange. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. Uh, next up on the agenda uh, is the citizen survey questions that the commission is 
Sometimes, Bill, when I look at the titles you've given, I should look at them more when <laughs> they're in draft. Yeah. Citizen Survey Commission Question Review. Okay. Um, I listened to the tape and appreciated and chuckled at the thought that Wendy thought she was getting through the agenda quickly, <laughs> <laughs> but appreciated your long and thoughtful discussion around the citizen survey questions. And um, thank you for putting the slide up. Um, I wanted to have an opportunity to weigh in with you and argue for um, a, a reason to consider the, the question which um, is, is Bill's adaptation of uh, one that I had started, which is on the third one down on your sheet. Um, so here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to um, walk through all three again, hopefully briefly. There are a few changes that Bill maybe can better highlight than, um, than I on the but the two that are physically at the top of the page. Um, and then just do a process of voting on which of, so on some two of the three. I think we'll just take them one at a time. Um, since the last time you saw it, the, th the one that's physically third um, says, I agree that the city of Moscow, and, and, and that wording I think is important in that it's not P and Z, but it's some broader view. It's asking the citizens some broader entity than P and Z should begin efforts to study the potential local impacts, and that was there before, of climate change and the potential local mitigation efforts. Um, one of the things that I heard on the tape was a concern that naming climate change was polarizing. And I'd like to share with you this, um, a couple of pieces of data from this paper that I recently saw. It comes from um, the, a, a project at Yale. Uh, and it was really aimed at, as you can see, uh, communication strategies. But they did some interesting work uh, in a fairly large survey. If I could have the next slide. Um, they developed a set of questions and a asked the 1,045 people this set of questions, and then did a mathematical technique called a cluster analysis. So some of the questions were, do you believe in climate change? Some of them were, do you feel that there are impacts uh, happening in the United States? Some of them were, do you feel that scientists agree? There was a diverse, and, and they grouped, and, and so what they, they call the article is that there are six Americas. It's not as simple as a polarization into two camps, that there are six different perspectives that they could identify. And what was important to them in the article was that those six perspectives required different kinds of messaging strategies if you were going to talk about climate change. Uh, and you'll see that they have, going across, they've labeled them from alarmed, concerned, cautious, disengaged, doubtful, and dismissive. And the sizes of the circles, the percentages, represent the, the fraction in their sample of people that were in those various camps. Uh, next slide. And what was interesting to me about that was the nature of what question the respondents would most like to pose to a climate scientist, ranging from they would like more evidence to causes, consequences, and actions. And what you see there is that the alarmed, concerned, and cautious groups, which were more than a majority of the individuals on the previous slide, are highly focused on action. And so my reason for thinking about the question is to see if, first of all, Moscow in any way represents something similar to the Six Americas, that it, is, it isn't polarly divided, but there is some spectrum of, of perspective. And if there is, is there a 
interestingly sized group who are interested in action. Um, if we ref represent the data here, we might expect to find that there are quite a few citizens who are interested in local thinking about local <coughs> action. So I offer that as a response to the conversation that I heard that this is polarizing. It potentially is. And we would learn that as a result of asking this question. And we may even learn that, you know, Nils argued for a bad question. We shouldn't have done that. Um, but I, I have reason to believe that that's not what we'll learn and that we will learn something that is interesting. And if we leave the table, the question off the table, we won't learn it. Then I want to come and talk about another a frame for why I think this is important. I think you interestingly pointed out the idea of water issues um, as one of the, the obvious local mitigation actions that we're, I think we're all concerned about water supply in our aquifer, understanding it, managing it, etc. What you don't know and what I've saw confirmed tonight is that the um, SEC, uh, Sustainable Environment Commission, is preparing a question for the same survey, which is going to ask citizens about their support of several environmental initiatives. So they're looking at, through their lens, at some of this same question. And the elements, and I've seen a draft, appear to be related to water conservation, low flow toilets, zero scaping, smaller lot sizes, and citizens' interest in increasing the number of shade trees. Um, so they are looking at the water in kinds of considerations in one direction. But there are other, it seems to me, climate water issues that might be explored if we had an answer to a question like I'm proposing with a broader mandate. That it is a broader question. Um, so while we know in the Pacific Northwest that we're lucky to be <coughs> predicted to have only 12% more extreme rain events, whereas the Northeast is predicted to have 72% more extreme rain events, we might still ask, have we got the right standards for bridges, culverts, and stormwater detention facilities? Citizens asking the city to think about this Citizens aren't really in a position to ask the question, are we got the right stormwater detention? But they could ask the city, think about this, and we might think about those stormwater issues. Um, have we got the right controls or capacity to prevent our sewer plant from overflowing? Uh, did we, de if we decide to design a water reservoir on Moscow Mountain, have we considered its capacity in light of both potentially larger storms and potentially longer dry spells between storms. Um, in addition to flooding, have we considered planning to avoid extreme events that knock out electricity, transportation services for multiple days, or, or have we planned to provide food shelter to augment during those emergencies? So my interest in that question, in asking this question, is to potentially, and I say potentially because I don't know how, how the citizens will come out on it, but potentially give us a, a framework for, for talking about um, a broader set of issues. And, 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 I, and I realize that what would happen would be that from the direct question, if it's broad enough and convincing enough, then the council and the mayor would be the ones who are really charged with positioning, deciding how to respond. Would they direct commissions to look at it? Would they do something else? Um, one of our recent readings suggested that incorporating climate change in key planning documents was a strategy to make the issue a touchstone in all the other planning activities that were being carried out. Um, so if citizens responded strongly, would the city choose to amend the comp plan or would it find some other mechanism? Um, you know, there are other outcomes to this question, uh, that, but I think they'd be equally informative. One would be the question is polarizing and we've refuted the Six Americas data. 
Another response could be, no, don't plan. We don't want the city to plan for this. Um, either response would change what I think and do. Uh, I, 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 it would be an important thing to know. So if we don't ask a clear question with broad implications, we allow ourselves to risk being stalemated on this critical topic. So that's my response to your conversation of two weeks ago relative to this question. Um, let's, let's talk about this one for a second, if you have other comments or responses, and then we'll walk up the sheet and talk about the others, and then we'll come back and we'll vote. To pick two, because I, I, we, I understand, Bill, we need to have two, not three. Yes. As the as the token denier of, of uh, man-made climate change, I I want to weigh it in favor of that question. If if you're going to ask about it, um, one of the concerns I had in the discussion w about the polarizing nature of it was that the alternate proposals for wording struck me as so vague as to be meaningless and not communicate the nature of the question that you really wanted to ask. Um, so I think just going straight at it is the best way to approach it. This is really interesting. I think that, that this graph here with the different, uh, I guess, the different question, needs of the, the different, different need, Americans. The different mm -hmm. not, not just the different positions on the one scale, but, but the kind, you know, where they're at on the, um, uh, whatever on the you call schedule, it. What, what the, they're the thinking schedule, about The schedule, yeah. the indicators. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, if you're, if you want to find out the opinion of the city, I think this is, I think this is the best way to do it that I've seen. Okay. W Wendy, you were clear in wanting to take a less direct approach. Oh, because I wanted to avoid polarization, I hadn't seen this study, and I, I agree it's very interesting. Um, I don't. I, I th personally think um, it's a it's a pretty broad-based question, and we are, as a commission, challenged or charged, I should say, to deal with issues of land use. And so I would like to see it paired with a question that makes sense in terms of how we um, start, and, and I, I think the one at the top starts to do that, where it starts to look at um, related topics and getting a read on how people feel about it, whether or not they believe in climate change. You know, do you think, <clears throat> what, what type of, oh, I, we so, I think those two pair well together. Uh, I, I don't think the third one, the middle, uh, the middle one, I'm sorry, um, relates to it. So we might get a, a general read, but then uh, it doesn't really give us any direction as a commission in terms of land mm -hmm. use decision making. And so I think in isolation, it's inadequate. That's um, that's my feeling. Mm -hmm. okay. so. Other thoughts on this one? Yeah, I vote one and three. <laughs> Top and bottom. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I think that's what I was trying to say. I just said yeah. it around the bush. <laughs> okay. Are there any others on this one? Otherwise, I'm going to move up to the middle of the three. And um, what I thought we might want to do on that one if you're interested in pursuing it, is do something around qualifying housing. That is, affor uh, housing options, uh, housing choice, affordable housing, which I have a hat on that would like an answer that used that phrase, um, housing for home ownership. Um, that it just seemed that as worded, it wasn't quite get us as much as we might get uh, if we were to, to choose to be something mo somewhat more specific about housing. Mm -hmm. So any okay. other thoughts or... You're talking, about, you're talking about the middle one there? Right. Talking about the middle one, is there a significant need for more housing? And I'm suggesting maybe qualifying housing somehow. I might say housing options. Mm -hmm. Um which would open it up to different types of, you know, thoughts, thoughts of, of different different kinds of housing options rather than just more housing. We need more 
buildings or we need more kinds of ways of thinking about housing for different groups. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay I have a, looking at both the, the first and second next to each other, um, the, the middle one, I, whether or not you agree there's a, a need for particular types of housing, I look at that and I think, okay, we get the answers back and what does that really tell us other than people have an opinion about that? The first one looks to be more actionable. As a, say, a developer is wanting to put some planned community in, looks at, this, looks at the, sec, the middle one, well, okay, great, people talk about that, but what's, what's the market for it? If they look at the first one, then, okay, I know I want to build residences, and these are the kinds of things that people say are important. So as I'm planning this and putting it together and bringing it forward for approval, this gives direction as to what kinds of things to to put in the development. Mm -hmm. it, whether it's, uh, you know, in uh, a development for seniors and retirees or, or whatever it whatever it might be. It, so the first one, I think, would give more useful information in moving forward. Okay. Any other comments on that on the I, middle one? I, I agree that the middle one, it's very hard to figure out what we would do with it. I, part, part, you know, I'm, I'm sort of inclined to say that uh, uh, we ought to have people rank uh, the four classes of, of housing and, you know, which, which, one, which one is the most critical issue or, mm -hmm. but then, but then I, the, I, I run up against the problem of, uh, you know, what's a four, what kind of housing? What's its cost? What's affordable housing? Uh, to me, uh, the, the middle one is is so ambiguous the way it is that I am not I'm not convinced we get much out of it. Okay. Okay. And I'm not really quite sure how to repair it. <laughs> And, and I'm thinking if it weren't such a late hour, I might send it on to fair and affordable housing folks. Yeah. And they might leverage off of it. But at this point, I don't think much will happen there. Okay. Um, Maybe. You're still in the middle one. Well, no, I, 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 I agree that the first and, and first third, third are the preferred ones. I, but I was thinking maybe there's a way to work into the first one mm. um, something about housing choices within a neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Would you prefer a neighborhood that has um, 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 multiple types of housing targeting multiple populations? I, I don't know quite how to say it, but um, um, or, you know, more homogenous neighborhoods, and that's not a good way to say it either, but that's what I mean, mm -hmm. is, um, you know, like, um, how much tolerance is there for diversity of housing types within a neighborhood? And that's what I don't, mm -hmm. um, and that's something that could be brought into this, because that's really what it comes down to. Because mm -hmm. I think if you ask this question, if it's a senior replying, they're going to say, sure, I agree. If it's a person with disabilities, they're not going to be talking for themselves. They're probably not going to fill out the survey. They get, you know, so what are you going to really find out from, um, uh, from Section 2, a uh, Question 2? So is there a way to take how the idea of housing choice and work it into the one above. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the first question kind of already does that when it talks about a he, mixture of housing types. Uh, types and to, um, yeah, okay, maybe it does. So housing types would, in, you know, include the different options of single family, attached, multifamily, um, and then we can set that as, you know, kind of signify the difference on the second one to talk about a neighborhood that has predominantly single family homes. Right. Um, and that way you're kind of looking at the tolerance of a variety of housing types in a neighborhood versus something that's more homogeneous and single family in nature. So, Bill, is that... I mean, this is really a walkability question. So so now we're trying to <coughs> kind of put too much into a question that's really about... I think it needs to be sorted out because I think it's too buried. I mean, you don't know if you're answering right. walkability or diversity right. of housing choice. And that's really what this is. So this is about the... the comp I mean, the, I think this question, which comes from the National Realtor Association question, is really focusing on what compromises are you willing to accept for a, a more walkable mm -hmm. neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And so it's really 
placing those things up against each other and saying, are you willing to accept a small lot to have walkability or a larger lot where you have to drive more? So I'm not entirely sure how we mm-hmm. – I, I don't think this is really a housing question. Okay. Yeah. And so my suggestion is it sounds like question one and three look reasonably good, and maybe those are the ones we should move forward with. If it's, if it's really a uh, um, uh, walkability issue, sh- shouldn't the housing types phrase not be there in the uh, – It should just be housing and stores. Uh, yes. Well, I think it's – sto- And stores? I think what they're really after is – a more integrated mixture of housing and yeah. commercial uses well, versus a more homogeneous single family and you have to drive. Well, that, then that's mixing the, uh, uh, mm-hmm. the mixture of housing types and the walkability uh, uh, It's one concept. of the compromises I think you're looking yeah. at of, yeah. of had to have more compact. You may have multifamily next to a two-family and a single family, yeah. and you have that mixture as compared to the homogeneous single family 12,000-square-foot yeah. lot that means the street ends up substantially longer so it is it is that will you accept the compromise of living in a neighborhood that has a mixture of housing in exchange for walkability or do you value a neighborhood that's more homogeneous where you is not as walkable and then then it gets to the yards and then it gets to um, the ownership or detached you know attached or detached and um so I think that's what they were kind of looking at, so the trade-offs I see. you may yeah. be facing. And, Bill, the top three of those are the national realtors ones? The top four. Top four. Okay, so so in some sense you'd argue we don't want to tinker with those huh. in that we can compare to national data if we don't tinker. So then the question would be, can Wendy's idea become a... One, two, three, four, number six of that block. A neighborhood that features a, a variety of housing choices. Housing choices. Versus and the, uh, one that is restricted to single, uh, to, uh, to a single traditional zoning type. Um, typology. Or, or to a single housing type. Like you could that. have Baker Street or something, right, you know, right. where it's all apartment blocks. Right. That doesn't, in my mind, though, address the, what the second one currently is trying to address. This is more about, in my mind, the type of people, the diversity of human types. The type of community. Not, yeah, yes, the not up, the diversity of community. housing types, mm-hmm. or, but of mm-hmm. the human beings that are in those houses. Mm-hmm. More diversity of, so a neighborhood with more diversity of residents. Yeah. Well, that, to me, that's how I guess I read that. If, if it were being incorporated in the upper one. Mm-hmm. See, I see it as each of these populations needs a specific housing type that's, that differs from another housing type, and it's not really about people. It's about um, what they lo- need to live in other than just a regular punch-out house that supports a family of four. I mean, you know, it's, it's kind of trying to, if you know, seniors and retirees usually I don't know. Um, so the neighborhood wouldn't look the same if you targeted all these populations with housing that actually accommodated their needs. It wouldn't look like a regular subdivision that just Correct. has single-family houses. Well, older folks couldn't necessarily live in the same kind of houses that young families do, but young families could live in the same type of housing that older folks do. I mean, it's like, you know, your handicap stall in the bathroom, you know. <laughs> but you end up with a house that's 30% larger in areas you don't need it. Yeah. And, and um, so it's... You have to have a larger house, you're saying, for... Oh, I see what you're saying. And, it, and was it really a question, that, and maybe I'm remembering it wrong, it wasn't that we... I didn't think we were asking, are we lacking <coughs> houses that... housing that is suitable for these groups as much as that we're lacking choices within those groups that maybe every senior and retiree doesn't want to live at Good Sam. What other things might they like if those options were in front of them? Mm -hmm. Um, And maybe all people with disabilities don't want to live in a group home. Are there other ways that they... I guess I 
was thinking maybe we were looking more at that than just quantities of housing that had some set formula that was supposed to fit that group. Did mm -hmm. that? Um, hmm. So here's the discussion I've heard so far. The, the top question and the bottom question are the ones that appeal to you. And you're struggling to find some way to represent some of the idea in the middle question as part of the top question. Is Let's that, do it. Okay. You've just stated it well. Okay. That's, uh, so, and, and I have heard some of the attempts at doing that. <laughs> none of them. <laughs> we realize we don't really agree on what the second the question is. Line, yeah. <laughs> is this question <laughs> due tonight? I mean, it's, um, due, it's due Friday. Do we have? It's due Friday. <laughs> so, so here, here's here's yeah. what here's what I'm willing to volunteer, if you wish, mm -hmm. that I will work with Bill. I'm volunteering Bill. Mm -hmm. That we will create a what one two three four five. There are five in that top block now. Mm -hmm. We will create a number six mm -hmm. that attempts to capture this idea of diversity of residents versus a single housing. You know, it's not a housing type, but a more homogeneous set. Of, I don't want to use the word yeah. homogeneous. I think what happens in as some of these as opposed to the yeah. physical housing and stores and stuff which is in the realtors number one this is trying to accommodate what kind of residents what kind of residents might occupy neighborhoods yeah. and I think I think what happens sometimes in surveys or whatever is that certain groups of folks are not even thought of I mean that, that there needs to be some trigger that will trigger folks into thinking a little bit Wider. So maybe we even need in parentheses, elderly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Disabled. Yeah. I mean, just to you know. Sure. So I that mean, we it's like you know, just thinking of white form. people all the time. So we don't just get diversity it, you know? being just but seriously a question uh, of race, but but a certain age group, or mm -hmm. we think of students, and then we think of young pro professionals, but all these other folks sort of fall outside of consideration, and let you unless you start. Um, I think bringing it up in some ways, subtle ways, whatever. And you know, if if, if I am an 84-year-old woman filling out this questionnaire as a city person, then I'll see like, oh yeah, they're they're thinking about me too. Okay. Or it'll have some relevance to me. I don't know. I would entertain a motion that said use questions one and three and Nelson Bill collaborate to add one more so moved. I have one more question though would this would number three be worded the way it is or would you switch it to be more more like what's on the screen hmm how would you like to word it differently I thought it would be worded that way I guess because I've never liked the the range of strongly agree down to no. this hmm. made more sense to me this is more engaging of my mind than. Okay, so you're, it, it's not the, it's not the I agree the city of Moscow part <clears throat> that is your focus here, but it is the labels on the. Can you yeah. help with some other idea? Yeah, uh, the way it's worded, I agree. I strongly agree that I agree. I don't know if I agree. I, I strongly ah, disagree okay. that I agree. I, it's the, the, it, you see what I mean? Okay, so yeah. we can change that. The city of yeah. the start this yeah, sentence. The off city of Moscow yeah, yeah, yeah. should. Right. And then. Just seems like there should be a way to what kind of tie it into the way this <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. question. Oh, yeah, and because really the that's what that's. To me, the city of Moscow's focus should be on evidence, on causes, on, I mean, something more like that. Yeah, or the alarmed, concerned, cautious. Ah, ah. If there's some way, does that make sense? What I'm, mm -hmm. but the I city think, of Moscow should. I think that's kind of a cool idea, actually. And okay. I also hate the word should. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> if it could, maybe okay. it's more like... <laughs> I doubt the original survey asked people if they were alarmed versus dismissive. There were, that's probably no, it asked right. them a series of subtle things, <laughs> and then it grouped them. <laughs> <laughs> they said all of those things, they're alarmed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Maybe it's not possible to do, but... I suspect that most of the questions are probably going to have that... Uh, that structure. That or could it structure, oh. and, and changing it to a different structure for one question well, is going to confuse well. people. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> and it's impossible to do it at 1025 at night. <laughs> That's okay. true. My um, brain's tired. So... Well, I mean, it could be something along the sliding scale of what um, priorities should the city of Moscow place on... Um, planning for um, climate change and range from action to no action, or something like that. To um, I didn't. I, I just lost my thought because I'm tired too. But I had a good. <laughs> 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 uh, should it be something actionable, or it's not a? It shouldn't be a priority. It's sort of that, mm -hmm. you know, something that's mm -hmm. uh, immediately of concern and, and needs to, action to be taken versus something that sh uh -huh. you see something in there like maybe <laughs> yeah. or should yeah. begin be looking efforts. for more research or and so it should begin a efforts a gradation. Well, you're going to need to have kind of some form of Likert scale response, right? It would, it would and, need a sliding scale in the language. Yeah. We have, you know, strongly agree. We have um, important, not support. important priority. I mean, we have strongly support, support, yeah. you know, neutral, do not support, uh, strongly do not support. Uh, we have questions that sometimes say, you know, uh, significant priority, a priority, neutral, not. I mean, it's it's hard to. I mean, we can certainly look if there's a different Likert response that would fit the question better. A lot of times they're phrased in, do you agree with this statement? Mm -hmm. And and so the strongly agree or agree. Uh, but, it, but I think a priority scale would be better because how important is it to people? You know, what... Um, so that, that very action important, important, be taken, not important. Right. And so hmm. an immediate or long, you know, sort of not a, not a priority right now kind of thing. I think um, we're playing around the edges and that we'd right. get pretty much exactly the same information from yeah, maybe so. five scales, whatever the word wording was. If you are willing, I would be willing to look with Bill at what the other options are, not wanting to diverge from what's on the survey, but mm -hmm. if there's a different set of five. Mm -hmm. Just take out the I agree. agree yeah, uh, that, right, and tweak, know, tweak that language just a word you know. or two to... I, I would even take out the word efforts. Uh, to begin efforts well, it sounds. To begin kind to of study. Like, okay, yeah. don't don't effort. Just to yeah. begin to study yes. the potential. I would like local to see impact. the city of Moscow begin. And, and no question mark at the end. Because <laughs> it's not a question. Yep, not a question. Right. That's better. Okay, yeah. I, so uh, that's better when it says, "I would like to see the city of Moscow begin to study." Is am, am I hearing? No, all, all I ended up with was the city of Moscow should begin to study the potential local impacts of climate change and potential local mitigation actions, period. Yeah. Okay. That'll work. And then that statement, the city of Moscow should begin, either has the strongly agree, disagree, or very important. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we have a motion on the table that directs Bill and me to work on a little bit more tweaking, and I think it's really to tweak both of them now from your discussion. Um, did we ever get a second to that motion? Second. There we go, Kurt. Any last discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions. All right. <laughs> Thank you. So the last item here is to review the survey. We're in the survey reviewing business for the ADU. And this is the survey that we directed staff to work on last, late last spring uh, to be run this fall. 
And I regret to inform you, I have failed you. I have not had a chance to get that together. Oh, oh darn. He's <laughs> 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 living in his back pocket waiting up for a break. <laughs> 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 I'm here about not breaking. <laughs> <laughs> and so if we could pick it up the next meeting. <laughs> Two weeks. Okay. I, I heard a motion to adjourn, and I'm going to go with it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, it has another milestone today. Oh.